let me suggest uh, we get started and apologies uh, because we're a few, a few minutes late uh, but this always happens in town just until we can wait that everybody is settled in their places but uh, first of all welcome to all of you here but also to those that uh, may be following us on um, through the webcast uh, thank you for attending this invitation to look at uh, what is uh, to many uh, the most important uh, discussion on international cooperation this year uh, worldwide, which is uh, setting an agenda post-2015. And from our perspective, uh, what we'd like to do is talk about the relevance uh, for uh, international trade policy and frameworks. So what we have been doing in the past uh, few months, I'd say, and if not uh, a year or two, is uh, following very closely uh, these debates, uh, knowing that the locus of negotiations is between uh, delegates in New York, uh, but also a word uh, of how many linkages uh, there are from the negotiations and the discussions in New York. In, uh, with many other topics that are discussed in other places. Yesterday we were in, um, in an ICTSD dialogue um, that uh, look at yet another topic of global uh, economic governance. And, and someone asked, why do you repeatedly bring these topics to Geneva where they have, when they have other natural uh, fora outside? And, and to me, what is sim simple as an answer there is that um, Geneva really gathers what should be the, um, if not the lead, the core of the trade policy making uh, from all over the world. Um, and so uh, having the, the discussion in Geneva about those issues where trade could contribute, uh, trade policy uh, could contribute, or where those other discussions could contribute, to, to the trade uh, uh, agendas, particularly the crafting of the frameworks, is, is always a, a critical concern to us. In the case of the post-2015 agenda, as I said before, many have written uh, about it and said it in different fora at various levels of, of uh, governance, including at top levels of governance, at the leadership level. Uh, that this is perhaps the most important discussion that is taking place, even um, for the next generation. So uh, the definition of uh, sustainable development goals, and then, uh, well, also I think definition of how we move forward on the question of financing for development, uh, decisions that uh, are taken by governments with respect to international cooperation uh, relative to climate change this year. And all of this compounded by and probably uh, put into a, 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 a same package, a one package, as the post-2015 agenda uh, on international cooperation for development uh, is probably going to determine how we go about that cooperation in the next 20 years or so. When the Millennium Development Goals were discussed and agreed in a very different process in, in New York back in the, in the late 80s, uh, nobody really thought what a long-term effect they would have, I think, as they were being discussed. Uh, or very, pe very few people did. Uh, I don't know how many of you in the room were the, at those discussions. Um, I had the chance of being around already at that time. And, uh, and there was a lot of a skepticism about the, propos the proposition of setting um, developing, uh, development goals. Uh, it is, I, I say late 80s, late 90s, I'm sorry. Um, now it's uh, 15 years later. They have uh, uh, obviously, uh, as a reference, 
to, uh, to development cooperation as a reference to policy making at the domestic level uh, and in many other ways uh, have had a, a great influence in, uh, in the design of policies and probably in the fate of, um, of economies and uh, the lives of many people. Uh, the, the proposition of the, of the SDGs and the, uh, the post-2015 agenda with the lessons that we have learned in the past 15 years and now through the very complex process that, that this has been going through, uh, it's promising to be even more important uh, as a, uh, again as a, as a reference for development and probably would have uh, or has the potential to have uh, more of an impact. The SDGs that were already agreed through that complex process, this is the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, as they are proposed, 17 of them with 169 targets, uh, have been analyzed by many people. Some think they're too many, some think they're too complex to really follow in, in, in its uh, execution and in, in, in terms of performance and achievement. Whatever it is, um, they have come uh, as an, an ambition, a very ambitious program. Uh, they are an ambitious uh, proposition. Um, they do gather the very broad support from all over the world, uh, its stakeholders, so beyond governments. And now it is probably crucial at this point uh, that uh, that ambition is matched in the discussions on financing for development particularly that, um, that uh, will be defined by mid-year, just before the summer, and then again in the in the final form of the uh, of the the final outcome of the post 2015 agenda. Trade uh, and investment, as they go in the in today's uh, economy together, are the, an important component of uh, of these uh, propositions on the SDGs themselves. Uh, but also in the documents that are being negotiated in the financing for development uh, process. There is uh, not only reference to trade policy uh, in the way that we understand it today, today so with a very broad uh, uh, conception of, of trade and investment policy and the frameworks themselves, um, but there's probably not necessarily a, uh, a coherent vision that can be thread to, to uh, again, the references to that trade policy in, in those documents. Um, this is not surprising, given that this is uh, the result of uh, compromises between negotiating parties with all these different interests, and uh, particularly with very different situations, developmental situations. Um, and, and then the, the all intricacies, vicissitudes of the negotiating processes uh, in, in New York and in the UN uh, setting. The, the hope that, that some of us that have been following again the relation between trade policy, the, the trade frameworks and sustainable development objectives or sustainable development policy aspirations is that whatever comes out uh, it's uh, reflective of the 21st century economy, the 21st century global economy, the way in which production and trade are organized today, that it helps us move uh, particularly or the shift in, in, in many economies from uh, uh, primary uh, commodity producers and uh, what it's for, for many is still a situation of of uh, uh, export-led growth, uh, the falling into traps of um, a low uh, income or low middle income or even uh, high middle income uh, uh, growth traps into uh, more enabling situations for development, uh, diversifying production, but also uh, geared towards sustainable production and consumption. Um, as development models.
for that, obviously, we don't we need some of the references there because that's what that this would be the post 2015 document. It would be a reference document. Um, it would set targets for some governments with respect to development cooperation. But the agreements that that really hardwired the functioning of the global economy today, they will be negotiated by by trade policymakers, and uh, and those are the binding contractual. Uh, arrangements that will really uh, gear and, and, and define uh, how these objectives are, are, um, are achieved. So there's um, a, a very important need for, for coherence. There's important need for coherence on the references to the trade and investment frameworks in those documents, but also to references on domestic policies that are, uh, again, related to the functioning of national economies in the context of global markets. So it's about domestic policies as much as it is about the, the international trade investment frameworks. The, um, are the, the elements uh, internally coherent and externally coherent with the realities of the trade system? Is anything missing? How could they be more ambitious? Uh, what are the implications of these uh, multilateral or regional trade elements for domestic policy? There are some references to regional trade um, frameworks in, in the documents. Mm -hmm. Those are the questions that, that have um, really uh, motivated us to organize this. this dialogue, which is also meant to be an information session. So what we will do is um, first uh, start with two contextual presentations, one uh, from Friedrich Soltau from the UN uh, uh, Department of um, Economic and Social Affairs in New York. Uh, Friedrich is the person following this closely in New York, and uh, he would speak to us particularly about the process towards September, where we are, what are the expectations, where are the um, uh, discussions on uh, and how they relate uh, to trade. But we, uh, we will also then ask uh, my colleague Alice Stipin, who's been following this now for a couple of years, to present what we call the map of the trade elements across the proposed, uh, both the proposed SDGs as well as the financing zero draft, which is the draft going to Addis Ababa for the Financing for Development uh, Conference. We will then move to a panel of trade experts uh, to just offer us their reactions to, to some of these, of these issues. And we were having that panel, Karsten Steinfeld from the WTO Secretariat, Marcus Bartley, uh, previously with the Australian Mission to the WTO, but now with the World Bank Group. Uh, Harsha Singh is uh, also our colleague at ICTSD, and formerly with the WTO Secretariat and Deputy Director General there. And we have asked, and he has kindly accepted, uh, Nicolas Imboden, the Executive Director of the Idea Center, and someone who has uh, more experience probably than all that is accumulated in the room that I can see on these topics and uh, particularly with um, specifically uh, development financing and trade. So that's what we do in the, in the first session. Uh, in, the, in the first session we go, sorry, to, through these two contextual presentations, then in the second session I'll just move um, to the audience and ask um, the panel to move up here and Nicola to take over and manage a debate and a dialogue on this. Um, then we'll go into uh, questions and answer session. In between the two, do we have time for a discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So in the agenda there will be time for a discussion uh, of the contextual presentation. So with that, let me just uh, again welcome you all here and, uh, and turn the floor then to Frederick to start with his presentation. Frederick, you get the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, and um, <clears throat> good afternoon to all of you. I'm very glad to be here at the invitation of ICTSD. My mandate was to uh, give you a view from, uh, from New York of the um, negotiations. That's the view in New York. And um, we spent many hours in that, uh, in that room 
and other rooms working on the um, outcome of the open working group, which in July um, last year came up with the uh, with the um, proposal on SDGs that's been uh, at the center of, of, of much debate and also is going to be the centerpiece of the post-2015 development agenda. Before I run on a little bit, just to see the mandate of that group, because it's very important to realize uh, why we have what we have. Why do we have 17 goals? Why do we have the... Um, uh, some of those targets, which I'll speak about a bit more in a moment. <coughs> we have them because the mandate of this group, the group was mandated, this is only part of the mandate, in typical fashion it's rather long, but uh, the first bullet point is rather important, uh, although it seems you know, quite anodyne, typical UN language, it, to balance all three dimensions. Um, if we look back at the MDGs, of course, we find a, a major focus uh, on, on the development, perhaps on the social side, but rather a neglect of the economic and uh, uh, dimension, and certainly the environmental dimension. MDG 7 is the sort of vestige of what one consider a, an environmental agenda. So the SDG set out from the beginning to cover in a balanced fashion all three dimensions, a much stronger focus on the economic side uh, and also, of course, on the environment. Maybe that's something to bear in mind as we, as we look at the set we have. Down to bullet five on the global nature and universally applicable. Again, the MDGs focused on the donor-recipient relationship within the uh, traditional uh, development paradigm, perhaps, one could say. Certainly, uh, the SDGs were meant to mark a break with that to a set of goals and targets applicable to all countries. Of course, not every target can be equally applicable to all countries. We have a differentiation in <laughs> development status and national circumstances, but the idea being that we have universally applicable goals and targets, so bringing in uh, essentially also under the umbrella, the developed countries whose obligations under the MDGs were largely focused under MDG 8, uh, the global partnership uh, in the sense of being donors. Uh, but under this agenda, they're also full participants uh, in, in a broader set of, of goals and targets. Then, of course, also the next bullet taking into account different national realities. One of the critiques of the MDGs has been that they didn't take account of different starting points uh, for countries. So setting global goals and forgetting the country start at different points is a little unfair. That reflects in some part maybe a misunderstanding of, of, of the way the MDGs were meant to be interpreted, but still the sensitivity governments had to say, look, if we design a new agenda, we want to make quite sure that uh, there are 193 of us, but we sit in very different uh, positions at the start of the development uh, and growth uh, uh, trajectories. So we need to take those into account in designing goals and targets. The last one focused on, um, <clears throat> on priority areas. Did we succeed in that? I don't know. We have 17 goals and targets. But one that's not here, but very, very important, is a break from a technocratic process, which, which I think Ricardo alluded to, the development of, of the MDGs largely led uh, within the UN system, uh, but not in the hands of governments. In uh, Rio Plus 20 in 2000, where this uh, mandate came from, government said, we want to be in the driving seat. This is going to be our agenda, not developed by technocrats, not developed by the UN system for us, but we are going to decide it. So that's a very important process, uh, legitimacy uh, difference uh, that we see in the SDGs. So there are the 17 goals and the 169 targets, which I didn't put into one slide, but the 17 goals. Now, you know, one to six is kind of the, the MDGs with a higher level of ambition. Um, but from there, we go into other areas, which, as I've said, pick up the economic dimension. So many countries saying, if we look at the MDGs, we're dealing with the symptoms, and I'm simplifying, but one critique again, dealing with the symptoms, but not addressing the causes of poverty. So, uh, you know, a goal eight and nine uh, on, on growth, nine dealing with infrastructure, countries arguing very strongly, we need infrastructure to be able to grow. We need roads, ports, uh, ICT communication links. Those are important to us, never mind... Uh, only uh, the other targets on, on social issues. Um, target 10, inequality. Uh, very strong push on that. This kind of this, uh, discourse we've had about leaving no one behind uh, that's been also popularized in, in, in books and so on about inequality. Greater concern uh, that growth uh, must be evenly spread and even as we grow, some are being left behind. Uh, and speaking of trying to prune the, the number of goals at some point, in the political process, the co-chairs of the working group dropped goal 10. Well, there was a huge outcry that made a comeback. So efforts were made to prune this agenda. Uh, and the fact is that there are strong constituencies uh, behind every single one of these goals. 
<clears throat> also, I want to just draw attention to goal 16. I think this is one of, for me, one of the major innovations of this agenda, because again, one of the critiques of the MDGs was, yes, we captured the poverty dimension, but the, the Millennium Declaration, which is really the touchstone, the, the, the basis uh, of, of the MDGs, the 2000 Declaration adopted by heads of state, uh, deals a lot with peace, conflict, governance, rule of law issues, but these were not picked up in the MDGs. So there was a very, very strong push during the negotiations to introduce, uh, on the one hand, the, the issue, uh, the, the question into post-conflict, uh, conflict resolution, the special situation of conflict countries, violence, rule of law, and this is kind of was collapsed into one goal, goal 16. Uh, if you're a specialist in these areas, some of those targets are not the strongest you might look for. But the fact that we've taken uh, what has never really been part of the sustainable development agenda, always been at the level of the chapeau or the umbrella about, you know, statements about the importance of inclusive societies, rule of law, that's always been there. You'll find that in the, in the chapeau, uh, in the introductory paragraphs of many sustainable development outcomes, but it's never been in the hard, in the hard part. Uh, in the targets and goals, and here we find it there. So this is a real, real advance uh, in, in, the, in the sustainable development agenda, um, <coughs> and, a, and a sort of a hook for a lot of work to be done, even if the targets for specialists might not be all that they, that they wished for. Um, two other things I would say behind this agenda is very, very strong is leave no one behind, which is kind of a slogan, but also points us to the fact that we can meet targets in aggregate. Um, but the concern behind this agenda is either to be universal, end poverty, not to reduce by 20% or leave 3%, or, but to end, uh, end hunger and the health goal, very strong targets on, on ending the epidemics of HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, um, so that we kind of get to the last person, get to the last person or the last case, uh, and also deal, deal in, our, in our approach with vulnerable mm. groups, realizing that if we tackle certain targets, uh, we have to pay special attention to vulnerable groups because it's easy getting the easy, the easy, uh, the easy wins. If it's poverty in, in, in perhaps in, a, in an urban setting, what about poverty in rural areas? Or uh, that kind of analysis needs to be put behind our approach uh, to, the, to the goals and targets. And something which I also need to stress, of course, is some of these targets might be a little ambitious, perhaps overambitious, but the agenda is specifically meant to be an aspirational agenda. So these are not meant to be hardwired uh, in, the in the nature of international law, the way we negotiate uh, uh, you know, provisions of international law. They're aspirational. Um, that also means they're not binding in the sense that, uh, in a legal, legally binding sense, but of course they have very strong political aspirations <coughs> and should be the, the launching pad uh, uh, to inspire action, not only in countries at the, at the country level, but also I, I would say within other regimes with other regimes that are, that are consistent or that are supportive of sustainable development, including the trade regime, uh, can find things here that are, if not explicitly trade provisions, are provisions that depend very much on action in the trade regime, such as on health. Uh, there's a strong commitment to dealing with non-communicable diseases, uh, such as diabetes. These are diseases which require a lot of interventions with expensive medicines that opens up, of course, new areas uh, of, of perhaps of contention, but also of action to make sure that people in developing countries which have a triple burden of disease, uh, poverty of course, with the old uh, scourges such as tuberculosis are alive and well there, but also a very fast rise uh, in, in, the, in the diseases of, of, of lifestyle such as diabetes. So, you know, we need a lot of action there, cancer and so on. Um, last thing I want to mention, many of you probably would have seen, or I hope some of you have seen the Economist article which talks about unsustainable goals and ask not for 17 goals, but for uh, 10 commandments. I think a very challenging, a good article to read to be challenged. I think the main problem there is that when we think about these, we should take the lens of the MDGs away, you know, and put on the lens of the development and sustainable development specifically. If you can do sustainable development in 10 goals or six goals, hats off to you. Um, I don't think that's possible. So we have to really see that what we're doing here, we're putting three things together, not just development, but also the, the economic drivers of development, economic dimensions, infrastructure, and so on, and a very, very strong focus, of course, on the environment, and those are reflected in these goals. Uh, we have a goal on oceans uh, and on biodiversity, so maybe that's incoherent, maybe that's impossible, you can have your views about that, but we have to step away and see we're not trying to replicate the MDGs. It's not MDGs 2.0 or MDGs Redux. So uh, I know that um, Alice will say more about trade and, 
uh, trade in, in, the, in this agenda. But I want to say a few short things. Um, trade is considered traditionally within the sustainable development discourse as part of the means of implementation. And the other parts there are finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. But trade is sort of being seen as supportive, one of the engines for reaching the, the substantive commitments uh, under the sustainable development uh, agenda here. And um, the, the SDGs and the targets under them do contain a number of targets which are very quite specific on trade and others which are more generally referencing trade, um, trade provisions. Um, and some examples are on subsidies, aid for trade, and so on. But I think Alice will, will deal with those in, in greater detail. Um, in the negotiations under the working group, over and over again, this tension that although there's a recognition that trade is important, there's a reluctance to delve too deeply uh, into trade topics, recognizing that this is a very technical area of work which is under the umbrella uh, here in, in Geneva of the WTO. It's often a, a case of, well, we want to do with this, but we have to be very careful. You know, let's, let's leave this to the specialists, and this is not something which we want to advance on too much. Um, so that leaves, and if that's the case, the question really is, can we foster an organizing or supportive environment uh, that supports sustainable development without substituting in, in New York uh, the work or at the technical level on, on trade rules? So what is the, the sort of the, the movement from, from a technical discourse, which would be taking place here, to a supportive, enabling environment? Uh, and I think that, that's really a question. The question is, has that succeeded? Has enough been done uh, in that respect uh, within, within the context of the working group and also within the context of the financing for development outcome? If there is this balance, has enough ambition or enough work and thought gone into, into doing that? And maybe that's something uh, we, we can hear about uh, as, we, as we talk. Since I have to do all the process, let me give you a quick overview of where we are going. I've kind of given you a sense of where we've come from. So, Having, worked, having finished the work of the Open Working Group, we now switch to yet another acronym, LIDEN, LIDEN, LIDEN process, the negotiations on the post-2015 development agenda. Um, and they began in January with a sort of stock taking. We then had a meeting in, uh, in February on the declaration. So the parts in red there give you the main elements of what will be the post-2015 development agenda. You know, what, what is this going to consist of? It's going to consist of a declaration so an overarching political statement that will supposedly be concise, it'll be transformative, it'll sketch out where we're going, you know. Um, it'll contain, the agenda will contain, of course, uh, probably at its center or its core, the goals and targets. Uh, and then very importantly, the means of implementation and the global partnership, you know. So the, global, the means of implementation are really the financing and so on. Uh, and the partnership is some sort of sense of, of, of the renewal uh, of MDG 8, but probably also having more recognition that the world has changed, that there's a greater role for the, uh, the private sector, that we need to mobilize new forms of partnerships around some of, these, uh, around some of these goals. So things like Gavi, the Vaccines Initiative, and other partnerships that can kind of, that are neither purely uh, private nor purely public, but that have some sort of uh, supportive uh, function in, uh, in achieving the goals and targets. And then lastly, very important, in May, we're gonna talk about the follow-up and review. This is essentially uh, uh, the, the, the framework for accountability uh, and monitoring. <clears throat> That's an institutional discussion about which institutions within the UN are going to review uh, this, uh, this agenda, how will it be, be broken up among these institutions, uh, how often perhaps, but really the, the parameters of, of the review. And hidden there too is also the, the role of the UN system. Will the UN system come and report? To whom will it report on its progress? Um, some of those elements will be under that, that discussion as well. But very important, of course, because we need to measure and follow up on, on progress we've made. And then leaving essentially <clears throat> some time to put all of this together and the you know, sort of hardcore negotiations through June and July. Uh, and then in September, the summit will adopt the agenda uh, in its final form. Now, before we get to the as you'll see here, the, the ADAS conference takes place uh, in the second week of, of July. So that means one big part of, of the final agenda, the means of implementation really, oops, wrong slide, uh, the means of implementation will be dealt with in ADAS. So even as we're working through some of the preliminary things, the discussion on goals and targets which we've had, looking at, um, uh, looking at the declaration which has been done, 
looming in the background is, is a discussion around the means, the money, the money and the framework around the money, the framework around uh, perhaps also some trade elements. That will take place quite late in the, in the day. So if that's a positive outcome, uh, the question is how do we take that and how is that inserted into the agenda uh, that will be finalized in the later July? So a very short, uh, compressed time frame to deal with a lot of big issues. Um, and one idea that was floated last week during the, the post-2015 meeting was that there would be a sort of an Addis light that, assuming there's a good positive outcome in, 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 uh, in, in Addis, that that outcome would somehow be compressed or or a, a, a sort of a highlight reel of that outcome would, be in, would become part of, of the post-2015 agenda. Because of course, if we have this element there, can we just reference it? Is it enough to say we welcome it? Probably not. We have to take, in some way, the, the substance uh, and in a balanced fashion, make that part of the, uh, of, of the total agenda in the end. But that, that's not settled yet. That's just sort of some <coughs> feedback from, from, uh, that, from initial feedback. <coughs> So the relationship between these two uh, needs to be worked out, and that's a large political uh, uh, a job that negotiators have to obviously focus their mind on. Uh, and they will be doing some of that work uh, in April to sort of think about what are the common elements, what are the core elements which we can draw together uh, into the post-2015 agenda. And then finalizing everything, as I said, will be a sort of a, a very big negotiation in July. Uh, putting in the review process, which not much is thought it's gone into, well, thought it's gone into, but not much, we haven't seen much of it worked out, um, which kind of institutions will do the, do the follow-up uh, uh, process, the involvement of the UN system. What do we do with outside parties that come into the agenda under the global partnership? How do we hold them accountable? How do we, can they report their progress? If the private sector is a major actor, how can we, how can we encourage sort of review, measurement, uh, that they can also be part of it, because the private sector is very bent on measurement. They take measurement seriously. The UN uh, review and, and follow-up can be seen in a poli more political light, but for the private sector, the commitments that are made are often made in a very um, hardened, uh, in a hardened, uh, a hardened way, which needs to be uh, t uh, you know, reported on and monitored very, uh, very um, rigorously if such commitments are made. And then, of course, implementation. Uh, in, in, in January 2016, the big task begins. Um, and as I close, one thing I, I should have mentioned earlier is we've had some discussion around indicators too. You know, the targets are there, but if you have new targets, you also have new indicators. And, and, and of course, your progress can only be as good as the indicators you use to measure it. And um, because some of the targets we have are rather in new areas, uh, there was more concern among delegations about the, the indicator process. So it's no longer just a purely technical process. Uh, we've seen uh, the, um, the post-2015 uh, group desire some what they call political guidance and oversight of the indi indicator development process. So the indicators will be um, developed by the Statistical Commission of the United Nations. It's a technical body um, that is headed by chief statisticians of the member states. Uh, and they have an initial draft set of indicators, indicative indicators, some 300 of them, which were uh, uh, circulated to, to statistical officers for their comment. Uh, they were reviewed by about 60 stats officers, and that report was shared with the, um, with the uh, negotiating, t uh, negotiating group. And um, they will continue that work. And in 2016, in March only, the Stats Commission will endorse a final report uh, uh, containing the indicators for the agenda. But member states are going to have an oversight role of the indicator uh, development, which is technical, but because some new areas are being touched on, uh, it has a political dimension which is um, which going to be addressed. So I think with that, I will leave it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frederick. That's um, a very good tour de horizon of uh, where the process is hard right now, as well as uh, thanks for also for your substantive okay. insights and your, your um, sort of plan, you have planted some queries there that coincide with many that we have as well. So Alice, um, Alice, as I said before, is uh, the senior program officer at ICTSD, uh, who is responsible for following up this process. She's been writing about it as well. Uh, so you can find some of her views on the relation between the SDGs and the post-2015 uh, processes and the trade system in our website and our publications. Alice. Thank you very much indeed, Ricardo. Um, I thought what 
might be useful uh, at this point in, in this dialogue is if I essentially sort of set the context of the substance. Um, we know a little bit more uh, now about the process, and I thought what might be helpful before we go into the panel discussion is essentially to map out for you where some of the key trade-related elements are in both the SDGs and now the Financing for Development discussion. So it's a mapping exercise. So the content of the post-2015 agenda we think will be made up of a number of different pillars. Uh, there'll be a broad declaration which provides the narrative for the next 15-year agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them and their 169 targets, will essentially be the what of the agenda, what are countries meant to be achieving. The means of implementation that Friedrich was discussing for the goals and targets in the, sust the Sustainable Development Goals and Targets will come both from within the Sustainable Development Goals and from the outcome document uh, of the Third Financing for Development Conference in Addis. As Friedrich was saying, we're not completely sure yet, or it's not completely clear how the means of implementation in the goals and how the means of implementation elements in the financing document are going to eventually come together. There will be a system still being defined that will review progress towards the goals, and there will be a set of indicators <coughs> which will be used to provide the basis for this measurement. Uh, and again, I think member states in New York are still working through exactly how that review process might work and what the indicators might look like. As Kirsten was saying, trade is considered broadly in the narrative a means of implementation issue. So when we look at all of these various pillars, at least at a conceptual level before we move to indicators, it's the interaction between the Sustainable Development Goals and the Financing for Development Outcome document that's probably of the most direct interest. <coughs> now, so far, the discussions on the Sustainable Development Goals and the Financing for Development are only now beginning to be merged uh, with this joint session towards the end of April. The discussions on means of implementation haven't been easy in New York. Delegations. I think, are grappling with a number of different questions. One relates precisely to this question of the location of the discussions. Should the means of implementation for this agenda be discussed in both the SDGs track and the Financing for Development track, or in a combined track? Or should they, or should they be discussed only in one track or the other, either the post-2015 agenda itself or the Financing for Development side? And the second question is one that I think Ricardo also alluded to. The second question concerns sequencing. The financing decision will be taken in Addis in mid-July. <coughs> the SDGs and their targets are, we think, bar some technical proofing and perhaps technical amendments, more or less final, but they'll only be finally adopted in September after the financing for development outcome. My sense, at least, from speaking to people in New York, is that there is a real desire to have the financing for development outcome match the ambition of the SDGs in order to ensure that both elements remain intact and that the post-2015 agenda can be adopted as a whole in September. So if we look in a bit more detail at what's in the Sustainable Development Goals that's related to trade. So this diagram essentially helps to identify what some of the key trade-related targets are under each of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, the relevant language on the Sustainable Development Goals is also collected in a handout that you have in your participant folder, so that may also help to decode some of the acronyms in this slide. So there are several trade-related targets that are identified as means of implementation or support measures for specific <coughs> Sustainable Development Goals. Some of these make a very direct reference to trade. So under goal two on ending hunger, there's a reference to a in a target to the reform of distortions in agricultural markets, including export subsidies pursuant to the relevant WTO mandates. Increased support for aid for trade is one of only two means of implementation targets under goal eight on sustainable economic growth and employment. The reform of other perverse subsidies, like subsidies to fishing, with reference to the WTO negotiations, is listed under Goal 14. So some of these targets make very specific trade references. Others, which I've included, are indirectly related to trade. So you see a number of targets <coughs> that refer to support for access to relevant technologies under the goals under on water and sanitation, Goal 6, access to sustainable energy, Goal 7, or infrastructure, Goal 9. And finally, there are several 
directly trade-related targets listed under Goal 17, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. And these are considered cross-cutting means of implementation. So they're support measures that would support the, the achievement not only of a specific goal, but of the entire framework of goals. And some of these targets refer to strengthening the multilateral trading system under the WTO, completing the Doha Development Agenda negotiations, increasing exports from developing countries, improving duty-free and quota-free market access for developing countries, including through simplified rules of origin for exports from least developed countries. So there's a whole range of direct and indirect, specific and more general trade-related means of implementation just in the sustainable development goals. So the other side of the discussion, of course, <coughs> is what's going on in the financing for development. Uh, and what we have at the moment, released on the 16th of March, is a zero draft of what the ADIS outcome document might look like. So this slide that you have here highlights what some of the key trade-related elements are in this other key source of means of implementation. So the zero draft for the ADIS outcome builds on the outcomes of the two previous financing for development conferences in Monterey and Doha. The document itself identifies in different sections seven core sources of finance, and you'll see them in the boxes across the top. So domestic public finance, private domestic and international finance, foreign direct investment, public international finance, which I've put up there as ODA, or Overseas Development Assistance, international trade is one of the elements, debt and debt sustainability, systemic issues, a lot of which refer to financial markets, and technology innovation and capacity building. So those are the seven core sources of finance identified in the document. And within that, of course, we're particularly interested in the international trade elements. And I think there are several things that are interesting about the trade section of the zero draft. It starts by, comp by providing a, what I think is a complementary narrative to some of the trade targets in the SDGs. So it draws on Rio plus 20 language in explaining the benefits of a universal rules-based, open, non-discriminatory and equitable multilateral trading system. Um, but it also talks about the importance of flanking policies. And it talks about the fact that with appropriate supporting policies, trade can also play, sorry, trade can also promote decent work, combat inequality, and contribute to the realization of the SDGs. So there's an interesting kind of complementary narrative element. Most of the SDGs trade references refer, or at least seem to my reading to have in mind, multilateral rulemaking. What's interesting about the zero draft is that it explicitly refers to trade's contribution to sustainable development at the multilateral, but also at the regional and the domestic policy levels. So at the multilateral level, the draft repeats many of the SDG targets references to the multilateral trading system, but it also reflects a number of relevant decisions taken at the WTO. It also refers explicitly, which I think is quite interesting, to the concept of regional integration and regional trade agreements and regional investment agreements. It refers, albeit briefly, to the importance of domestic flanking measures to ensure that trade contributes to sustainable development outcomes. But I think the, this is all very interesting, but I think what's, what's most interesting is when you read or across the two documents together. And I appreciate this is an exceptionally complicated slide, uh, which is why it's also in the handouts that you have in your... Uh, in your participant folders, and I'll make sure it's on the website as well. So putting both of these means of implementation pillars together and trying to read across them, so to speak, to build a bit of a map of the trade-related elements, here is what I see. So I'll follow the FFD draft's coverage of the multilateral, regional, and domestic policies, and I'll focus a bit on where the financing draft expands, or at least does something a bit different from what's in the Sustainable Development Goal targets. Now, in this diagram, there are areas where the financing draft repeats or overlaps with the targets that are in the SDGs, and those are in the red boxes, and there are elements where it adds slightly to what's in the SDGs, and those are in the green boxes. So to start then with the multilateral trade system references. So the zero draft reiterates many of the multilateral trade targets, but it adds references to some relevant WTO decisions, and Karsten will talk about these in a bit more detail later. So the financing draft underlines the SDG target on strengthening the multilateral trading system, but adds references to meaningful trade liberalisation and the issue of, the, of fragmentation caused by regional trade agreements. So it's a slightly... It's a sort of a two-sided reference to strengthening the multilateral trading system. 
the financing draft underlines the goal, sorry, the target in goal 10 about implementing special and differential treatment in the WTO, but adds a reference to the monitoring mechanism agreed in Bali. I'll skip, well, actually no, I'll, I'll go through these in case it's useful. The zero draft, so re reiterates the commitments in SDG target two to correcting and preventing restrictions in global agricultural markets, and adds in a reference to fishery markets. Perhaps, and I can only speculate because the draft doesn't make a separate reference to fisheries subsidies reform, which was one of the elements of the SDGs. It references the importance of TRIPS flexibilities, including for public health, and goes a little bit beyond what's in the SDG target by adding a reference to responses to climate change as well. But it, it fills, the zero draft fills a particularly important gap, I think, left uh, by the SDGs by bringing back in the concept of trade facilitation. So it calls for WTO members to ratify the Bali Trade Facilitation Agreement and complements this reference to soft trade infrastructure with a reference to multilateral development bank support for hard trade infrastructure. In terms of LDC issues, the draft reiterates SDG, SDG target 1712 on duty-free quota-free market access, adding a reference to the relevant Bali decision and references to simpler rules of origin. Again, it speaks again about, it repeats the, the SDG target or references the SDG targets on aid for trade, especially for LDCs, but perhaps in addition to the SDG target, welcomes cooperation between developing countries in this area. Moving on to the regional integration and the regional trade agreements elements. So the, FD, the FFD draft expands on the scope of the trade elements in the SDGs, but I think there are a couple of sort of underlying tensions in what the Financing for Development document says. And the first is this reference to the fragmentation of trade rules. So the zero draft includes commitments both to strengthen regional integration and regional trade agreements and to strengthen the multilateral trade system and to work towards reducing fragmentation caused by international trade and investment agreements. The second tension, I think, relates to balancing the benefits of meaningful trade liberalisation and trade rules with the right to regulate for other policy objectives. The zero draft suggests uh, that a focus on transparent negotiation and implementation of regional trade agreements would help to not constrain policy making that, that would address inequality environment uh, and sustainable development objectives. And the third and last level is the concept of domestic policies. So the draft calls on countries to implement sound domestic policies and reforms conducive to realising the potential of trade for sustainable development. This, I think, is a crucial addition which helps to underscore the importance of domestic policies and harnessing the benefits for trade. And there are even some suggestions, I think, in the domestic public finance element of the draft about what some of these policies could be, be it the reform of fossil fuel subsidies or transparent public procurement that supports sustainable development. And I think the, the questions that are probably left, um, even, in an, even in an analysis and a mapping of what's there, the questions that we're left with are those that Ricardo spoke about in his introductory comments. Is this what we have here really coherent with the realities of the trade system now and with the realities of what we think the trade system might look like or how it might develop in the next 15 years? What about its internal coherence with the rest of the SDG targets? Is the FFD document in the draft as it stands ambitious enough <coughs> to match the ambition of the 169 targets in the SDGs? Is there enough support or would this garner enough support amongst member states to make them all feel comfortable adopting the SDGs and the targets as they stand? Now the next panel is going to look in a bit more detail on specific aspects of this agenda. But my own sense is that while the draft reflects very well where we are now, what WTO members agreed in Bali in December 2013, for example, I'm not sure it says very much about where we want to be in 2030 or practically how we might get there. And I think one of the questions that uh, hopefully we can get into in the discussion that comes next is, is there anything missing? Are there things that really should be in this agenda that aren't? Um, or is it simply a question of explaining, perhaps at another level of detail, how these key elements could support implementation of the SDGs? I'll stop with that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, okay, so you have two uh, rather comprehensive presentations on the process on on the post-2015, and uh, as well as an analysis of what um, it's already contained there in the in the current documents as they are. 
Um, let me just open the floor and uh, suggest we have some 20 minutes uh, to listen to your comments or questions. So when you take the floor, just please uh, identify yourself and uh, given constraints of time, be as brief as you can. Yes, in the, in the back, please. Yeah, I'm Dunja Krause from UNRIS, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development here in Geneva. I have a relatively general question, and first of all, thank you for these comprehensive overviews. I think they give a very good picture of the complexity of this challenge that we're all facing, where we have to deal not only with different pillars of sustainability, but different levels of implementation, different actors that are involved. And I was wondering, if we look at these different goals and trade already being so complex is just one of them, how do we actually deal with goal conflicts? Um, you've mentioned that some of the trade agreements, for example, they might actually be in conflict with some of the other sustainable development goals or there are not very clear mechanisms of how we pursue this agenda. So my question is really, how do we get to a point where we can actually negotiate what should be kind of the priority order um, in case there are conflicts or trade-offs that we cannot avoid? Thank you. Oh, thank you. That, that's an excellent question, and let me suggest that we, we don't uh, uh, expect that, that Friedrich or Alice would have responses to these very, very complex questions in themselves and challenging, but rather that the audience feels that questions uh, they could, you could feel free to contribute to, to uh, comment or respond in the questions that are asked by other people um, in the room. So I have Raf here, please. Thank you both. Uh, that was excellent. And I, in spite of its complexity, I think this simplifies them for us, uh, your chart. Thank you, uh, Alice. It's fantastic. Um, Friedrich mentioned that unlike the MDG process, which was UN-driven, seen as technocratic, that the um, SDG process was quite different and therefore government-driven. But government-driven isn't the end of the story because as Alice has pointed to the FFD, it's the private sector that wants to measure, that will insist on indicators, that will be called upon to bring the major portion of the funds for uh, implementing these, these goals. And so uh, I, a question to both of you really is uh, to what degree is the private sector built in to the SDGs? If you say it, I mean the OWG process was meant to include civil society and academia and private sector, but I suppose is it now really a government driven? And and then um, the the outstanding question of who tells the private sector other than through enabling environments where to invest their money? How is it going to be different from business before? Okay. Thank you, Raf. Any other? Yes, please. Hello, um, I'm Alfita. I'm from the SPS committee of the WTO. So uh, thank you for a very, um, very good um, explanation of how trade related to this. But I have an uh, opinion about um, the inclusion of the special and differential treatment in this slide is not that appropriate. Um, according to my very limited knowledge, of course, because um, from legal perspective, the special and differential treatment basically has no theme. It's basically just help the members feel happy. The developing countries feel happy about that because they are given, um, you know, sorts of, of um, okay, we care about you, but then the developed country doesn't really need to do anything and has never been brought to dispute. And because everybody hasn't said anything about that, then the gap is big. But on the other hand, um, I see that WTO contribute to this goal in the terms of the work of its committee. Um, I, I'm from the SPS committee, so we know we have technical assistance that help a lot of developing countries understand their obligations and to engage more in trade, developing their standards and stuff. But I think the spatial and differ, uh, differential treatment itself doesn't really add that much to the, to the goals that we are talking about. Thanks. Okay. I, I'm a bit confused by, by your comment. Uh, so. So what you're saying is that the, the, the calling for a strengthening SDT as it's really what it's in the goals doesn't add much to the to the goals. That's it. Um, so basically, like um, yeah, or there. <laughs> So we have SDTs in every agreements of WTO, 
But again, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just for the conclusion of the agenda. So putting it there, not uh, necessarily appropriate, in my opinion, if you put the works of the committee itself, the, the work of the secretariat itself, then it basically helps the linkage. But the SDT itself is not. Thank you. Anybody else uh, on any of these uh, questions? Yes, please, and then like to Karashi. Thanks for this uh, <clears throat> great and timely event. I'm Shanda Sarkovsky from the U Mission to the WTO. Three quick points where I would like to seek your views how thinking is evolving in the in the UN context. One, from the EU perspective, uh, given the complexity uh, and the, uh, and the necessity for for expertise. We fully recognize the primacy of, of WTO uh, with regard to trade issues at global level, and I think this is a very important point if you want to be efficient. The second point I want to make is that, and that was uh, evoked by the speakers, that each can, the country has a primary responsibility in our view for real, realizing the potential for trade. So indeed, the ownership, uh, good governance, and sound domestic policies are, are essential. And the third point <coughs> is that uh, uh, unilateral preferen preferences continue to matter. Uh, and uh, we think that from this perspective, all develop, uh, developed uh, countries, but also upper middle income countries and emerging econ economies, they, ha they have their share to contribute uh, to this, among others, through providing duty-free and quota-free access to the market for LDC products. So I wonder what is uh, your, your take on, on these points. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kuraj. Ah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, first of all, I wish to thank the panelists and those who, especially to Mr. Fr Fr Fridge, Salto, and Alice, and Ricardo as well. We were there yesterday as well in one of those G20. Uh, I wish to... Uh, it's it's some some uh, excellent presentation, but uh, it's really hard to comprehend at the first instance that how to go forward. Uh, but a few uh, preliminary uh, comments. While you, uh, Alice mentioned about domestic regulations, which uh, perhaps uh, were one of the reasons for. Uh, how to make them more compatible with the international environment and to f find a way forward in trying to implement the agenda because different countries were at different uh, levels. Uh, yes, it is indeed a challenge and a daunting challenge indeed. But uh, at the WTO where we see uh, currently is that uh, one of the WTO's negotiating arm is almost limping at the moment so they are not really coming forward with what they are supposed to do and uh, that is because some of the uh, areas have really uh, not been addressed for example the services part which of course accounts for whatever uh, I mean whether you talk of social dimensions or economic dimensions or development dimensions all of them have a services uh, part which has to be factored in. So that could be one reason of assessing and trying to address uh, things from that particular perspective. Yes, I agree that there is uh, uh, now a concern on the spaghetti ball phenomenon of uh, so many um, different uh, R RTAs, PTAs and other things emerging and yesterday we heard a very novel another concept of rules diversion and rules creation instead of trade creation and trade diversion but it's it's really worth uh, mentioning it. So how do you really uh, coming to the question exactly now after this how do you really see that what needs to be specifically factored in in terms of priority Let's prioritize the things because that's the most important uh, thing out of this platter. What are the things that are doable and which could be really addressed and 
uh, and come uh, bring some something to show exactly to the community, the international as well as the domestic. So this is just a preliminary uh, remark. I'll come back later when I hear more comments in this. But I congratulate you. It's an excellent an achievement, and we have to uh, chip in all of us something that is worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and that was Dr. Kalash from the Pakistan Mission. Um, but also thank you for for making that last remark. That's that's our intention, as I said before, at, at ICTSD. It's uh, really to prompt. Um, your interest and therefore your guidance to, to the, in the negotiations as we go into this very final sprint um, and uh, as complex as the process is. Uh, Hans Peter. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you to the could, presenters. Could you introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, Hans Peter Werner from the Development Division WTO. Um, just about in the comment uh, on ST and D and the MM. Uh, I understand this chart is basically um, saying what the multilateral trading system could deliver. So we, we had a, an early um, herv harvest in Bali with the monitoring mechanism, but we still have an ongoing negotiation on SD&T where um, members can hopefully put some more meat on, on what they want out of uh, special and differential treatment. And the other question I have is, is um, for the New York process, the the Addis Conference, it was mentioned, and this was also mentioned last week at the UN uh, ECE Conference on Financing for Development, that the Addis outcome will be very important for, for New York and for the, uh, for the September General Assembly. But the, the meeting in Addis is basically for, for finance ministers, and we have a lot of health issues, a lot of environment mm -hmm. issues, a lot of trade issues that may not get as much play as mobilizing resources through, through banks, the private sector, et cetera. And I was wondering if you could perhaps, if you know any more about what's happening in New York on this, um, shed some light on that. Thank you. Thank you, Hans-Peter. And, um, and thanks for that other uh, clarification on the, on the WTO um, end of things. Um, on the Addis, I think one, one point I'd like to just um, stress again, although it's been already um, made from from these presentations is the um, the concern that that the Addis result uh, comes up at a at a higher or lower level of ambition. So it doesn't match the ambition of the of the SD, of the SDGs particularly, right? And then how to accommodate accommodate the different levels of ambition, and so which is why I think the international community has now, in my opinion, very late. Uh, come to to uh, really an understanding that this is as critical a process and a negotiation as um, the larger negotiation on post-2015. Um, I saw Harsha, you wanted to come on this, or, or do okay. you, during your panel? If the SMB question is not answered, I'd like to answer that. Uh, pl please do. Should I? Yeah, yeah please. <coughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a very important question because that's a perennial kind of uh, issue which has come up with S&D. However, to say that uh, it's not really substantive, uh, perhaps in SPS and TBT because these are standards. And in standards, effectively in, on the ground, S&D doesn't really apply because when you have to sell and you have to meet those standards. So, in effect, standards uh, are effectively MFN, but that doesn't mean S&D is not important because S&D takes place in many ways. One is technical assistance. One is lo longer implementation period. Another is lower uh, uh, obligations. So S&D does uh, facilitate not only because there is S&D, but substantively through its contents. Second, it has also been brought to dispute. Uh, particularly, in fact, I was a secretary of a, an anti-dumping panel, I remember, and we tried to analyze what the S&D provision uh, actually implied, and I'm sure there are, there are other panels you'll find. So, you know, on both counts, it's meaningful, and it is something which, without uh, its inclusion, will not be seen as a balanced uh, conclusion. 
Thank you, Harsham. Okay, so with this, I think um, I'll go. I'll come back to the panelists. Um, just be aware that we're running a bit uh, over time, so if you could be as efficient as possible and just touch upon any of the comments or questions that were made. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you to uh, the, quest the um, people posing the questions. I think there are two questions on, on sort of trade-offs and priorities. Uh, as Ricardo said, very, very difficult to answer, and perhaps something which is more uh, benefit from collective reflection rather than a quick answer uh, from a podium. I would just say that we have 17 goals and there's a very large number of targets. We have an agenda made by countries, so they own it. These very different countries own this sort of higgledy-piggledy, somewhat inelegant construction they've made, but it's theirs. So that means, you know, the incentive to, just to, <coughs> to implement, uh, to take charge is there, which wasn't so much there with, with the MDGs for a while. And countries took a while to warm up uh, to, to the MDGs. So that, I think, is a positive. And I think that ultimately, countries will look at this and prioritize on their own. They'll say, this is what applies to us. We care most about health, and this is where we're going to focus. Uh, so it'll be a self-selection process, I think, uh, and, and I think an overall rational prioritization process probably isn't possible. I think humanly that just won't work. It's going to be a political prioritization done by countries at the national level uh, in consultation with their partners. Um, on, on the private sector participation, I mean, the open working group is being lauded now, and I think correctly for being very open uh, to stakeholders, including the private sector. Um, and I think the big question is in the implementation, how do we bring uh, their, them into, into that? I think that's, you know, the UN way of thinking isn't always, doesn't always gel with the way the private sector works, you know. Um, but I think they have enough in this agenda to, to get their teeth into, you know. So if the, the private sector sees uh, potential, there is enough here certainly for them to be involved and to shape the implementation that also favors their interests. Uh, because they have interest in this agenda. Um, they have interest on the rule of law, they have interest on, on trade and so on. And there's a lot of opening uh, in this agenda for them to, to shape the implementation process. Um, I think I will leave it there. The other questions seem of a more technical nature. Alice. <laughs> Alice. Thank you. I, I wonder if I might try and hit a couple of questions with one stone and explaining that this chart um, <coughs> is more a reflection of the way that I'm reading the Financing for Development draft and comparing that to what's in the Sustainable Development Goals. So, you know, the green is not my own suggestion. The green is simply what I see the Financing for Development draft adding to what's already in the Sustainable Development Goals. So whether s and should be there or not, question for debate. Um, the fact that it's on the chart simply reflects the fact that it's in the documents, um, not a value judgment. Um, and perhaps just one question on the one point on the regional trade agreements. At least the way that I read the financing for development zero draft, particularly compared to the elements paper for the same document which was released in January, this draft is considerably more positive about at least the potential for regional integration and regional trade agreements to contribute to sustainable development. Now there are the tensions there that I mentioned, there's this question about fragmentation, there's the question of the balance between the benefit of rules and the benefit of the right to regulate, um, but I think the, at least as I read it, and I may be wrong, but at least as I read the document, the sort of the general approach is more positive. What could regional integration help uh, with in terms of sustainable development? And perhaps just one very last point on the contribution of the private sector. I completely agree um, with the points Friedrich has made about how open the open working group was. It was open in nature as well just as just in name. Um, and my sense at least is that the private sector is thinking about what the outcome of the post-2015 agenda will mean for its own activities. Um, you know, there are elements of it who are already thinking about, well, you know, what will the goals and targets mean? How can we support through our own business activities these sorts of sustainable development outcomes? So I think there is, there is an engagement uh, from the private sector. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of comments uh, on my part before, before we move to the next panel, where you're going to see many of these questions also uh, taken care of and, uh, and discussed. One is uh, to call your attention to, again, the, the moment in which we are. So there are four sessions remaining in, in, the, in the year to, um, to really define um, the final outcome, to, to really conclude that. Um, 
The next one is on the 21st of uh, April, and uh, it will focus on these questions of uh, means of implementation. Um, so it would be probably interesting if you have concerns about this, these drafts or you'd like to, to contribute somehow that, um, that there is some conversation between Geneva and the delegates in New York on this issue. We will continue to promote that type of conversation. On the nature of the, of the texts, uh, something that um, uh, has been said, but it escapes people on what, it, what uh, that the potential that it has the, uh, is that the, this time around, this post-2015 agenda is global in nature, which means that it's not a, a, a one-way sort of uh, street as was the MDGs in a way. Um, it, also, it also doesn't speak about development cooperation really in terms of ODA only. It, it makes a great emphasis on the leveling and, uh, and mobilization of resources at the national level, but also of investment and financing in different ways uh, from the private sector, uh, recognizing that um, ODA is actually not only insufficient but inadequate to address many of the, of the issues um, in, in, in this, in this um, uh, set of, uh, of objectives. Then back to the, the, the question of implementation of special differential treatment because it's a very good example. The, the issue here too is that the documents don't come out, don't come out with language that is really um, innocuous and, and rather and may be confusing, right? So, so one of the things that in the UN world is, uh, is very puzzling is how you go into legal arrangements uh, you know, through treaties and uh, such as the WTO uh, multilateral agreements and then you have a UN document that just reiterates that you have to comply with this specific obligation that you have there or something of that sort right and, and uh, so instead of that what would be interesting is to come up with more granular approaches to what is what could add value to what is already out there. And the final comment, um, I think, is that sort of building on what just Alice just said, is that in the world of today, as Sandra said before, I mean, we all recognize, particularly in this town, the centrality of the WTO. But I, w I think we also have moved from understanding that, uh, moved into understanding, rather, that uh, the WTO remains a fundamental piece of what it's a very uh, large and uh, uh, more uh, uh, in, in a way um, complex but also uh, differently organized world based largely on the principles and norms of the WTO and which is the regime complex on trade and investment at the global level. And so for a document in 2015 to speak to trade as if it was all dealt with through the multilateral trade system it's, uh, it's really of, of little purpose, um, given particularly that the, the rules on trade and investment and the uh, arrangements on the 21st century economy issues are being constructed uh, through other type of arrangements. So that's why the, the, the focus on regional trade agreements is so important at this time, and that we have recognized in the panel um, by inviting Harsha Singh to address that question. Likewise, on domestic policies, so the document is, is full of also um, references to domestic policies, which in a, in a world where you have uh, an integration of national economies, but also production processes that are um, highly and deeply integrated, um, that bring together, as was said before, services and, and, and goods and investment and know-how and, and uh, uh, intellectual property. Uh, References to domestic policies cannot be made in isolation of, of how, uh, again, those economies uh, and those processes uh, operate in, in, in global markets. So with that, uh, well, the, the last comment I, I make, uh, because I think it's of, um, of use to all of you, is that if you are not familiar with BioRes, uh, we follow through BioRes bio very closely all these processes, uh, including on the SDGs. And, uh, and we have uh, uh, constant updates on that. Mm -hmm. And so I will encourage you to, do, to, to follow by ours. I think um, what I have to do is now 
get off the panel. And uh, Frederick, you come with me. And we invite uh, Nicholas and Bodin to take over. So thank you again to um, um, Alice and um, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, welcome to everybody for this panel on the specific aspects of trade of the SDGs. But first of all, let me start with uh, an official protest, you know, to Ricardo. You know, I'm not as old as he, in, uh, as he, implement, as he implied when he presented me. So please disregard that remark. <laughs> uh, secondly, I want to say that I'm not at all a specialist of post Bali 2015 or the SDGs, nor of the Bible for that purposes. And that's what I was reminded to when I read it. Uh, so I will give actually more uh, a view from the outside of what, what this is. I read it with a lot of, uh, of, uh, of interest uh, because it was quite, it is quite interesting. And I wondered, you know, what is this all about? You know, what is it supposed to be? And actually, uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, <laughs> the Friedrich Soltau, you know, said at the luncheon, well, it is like a constitution. So by definition, it's a vision. It's something we are not going to attain necessarily, but it's sure supposed to help us. And I think that's a good interpretation. Except there is one problem. In a constitution, I have some rights. You know, if, I, if my rights are not fulfilled according to the constitution, I can go and try to, to get them implemented, at least in theory. But in the, in the SDGs, we cannot do that, even not in theory, you know, so that's, that's kind of a problem. So I thought, well, actually, it's more like, you know, the New Year's uh, declarations or intentions that you put up. Uh, you know, we do that every year, you know. I, I have been doing 40 years that I would stop smoking, and I'm still smoking. So I decided it's not good to have such a clear target, because there you realize that you are absolutely not fulfilling it. The best way to have a good uh, New Year's, uh, uh, not declaration, what you call it, uh, in, in resolution, is to have money, you know, and have it at a very general level, because then you can always say, well, I haven't achieved them all, but I have achieved them, and, you know, for the others I have been partly. So I think that is what happens when we make a vision for the world at, at that level. You know, basically, those poor guys who had to make this vision, you know, they had the choice between saying something that was really uh, making a difference. But there people don't agree. And then you have a mess. Or you say things that, you know, nobody can disagree. I mean, nobody can disagree to the objective of eradicating poverty. How can you be against it? So you have an agreement. And that is actually a big advantage of, of the UN compared to WTO. Because they do come to an agreement. While we are not able to come to an agreement at WTO. The reason is also because, you know, they can come to an agreement that they don't have to fulfill it afterwards. While in WTO you have that problem with the dispute settlement, you know, and that makes it uh, rather difficult to come to an agreement. So, is that all 
Am I sarcastic? No, I'm not sarcastic. Is that useless? No, it's not useless. I think it is very important that from times to times, you know, we all get together and decide actually what is our vision of the world? How should we go ahead? What is it? Even if we don't agree on how to implement it, at least that we have a common vision of what kind of world we want to live in. And in that sense, I think it is useful. And that's basically the way I was trying to look at it afterwards in terms of trade. And there, I must admit, I was disappointed. Uh, I understand that it's not easy because basically uh, trade is a horizontal issue. It's basically something that needs to be done to get all of those uh, different uh, objectives attained. And so it is not easy to put it in. And I think the, the table that uh, Alice made, uh, unfortunately no more there, was a very good example how it doesn't work. You know, here you have uh, growth and under trade you have aid for trade. You know, quite frankly said, if trade policy to the, the contribution of aid policy to, to growth is aid for trade, I'm going to go and lynch myself. You know, I mean, there is clearly much more to it than that. But if you have to try to put the things into the different categories, that's what you get. That's unavoidable. So what I think is, what I wanted to, or what I hope to, is to get a vision of what is the trade environment, the enabling trade environment that we need for sustainable development in the world. And that I haven't found, quite frankly said. And I think that is something that should be there. We had a lot of discussion at, at the luncheon, you know, is it up to New York to make that? It should be here in WTO. Forget it. In WTO, we cannot do it. We cannot have a vision in WTO. In WTO, they are mercantilists. They are trying to negotiate tits for tats. That's their job. That's what they're paid for. You have not a vision in that way. The vision has to be a political vision. The vision has to be done in, in, in New York, not in Geneva, in my opinion. But they shouldn't go into the technical details. That is up afterwards to the, to, to the WTO how to do it. So what I would have hoped is to have a vision of the trade business. And what is in a vision of a, of a, sustain, uh, a trade environment that is uh, inducive to sustainable development in the world? What is that? Well, I, would, I look at the problems that we have. And quite, of, quite frankly said, the biggest problem, in my opinion, today is the diminishing role of WTO as an inclusive system that is defining the rules of the game in the world. The WTO has lost the premacy. Not only it's going to lose, it has lost the premacy. Today, trade rules are made uh, to a large part exclusively in the mega deals, in the plurilaterals like TISA, where a few countries, just like in the old GATT, I mean the big ones, are defining the rules and tell the rest of the world, now you can follow them or not. And they have to follow them, whether they like it or not, because if you want to export into those, those countries, you have to fulfill their regulations. So this is a big danger. What should we do? Say, no, you cannot do mega deals? Forget it. You cannot do that. That's allowed. But I think in a vision of the world, I think I would want to have a WTO that fixes the principles for those mega deals, which makes sure that there are no exclusion, no, not people or interests completely ignored when we make the rules. And that should be possible. Practically not, but at the political level, as an objective, I think that would be possible. The second big issue in today's world is that the, global, the, the way trade is done has completely changed in the last years and is continuing to change. It's the so-called global value chains. They are very important. And no country, no country can develop if it's excluded from those global value chains. You need that for all the development goals that we have put up here. You need it for growth, you need it for equity, you need it for jobs, you need it for everything. Global value chains are very, very important. And who is excluded from the global value chain? Who is in none of the global value chains practically, or only as a, a supplier of primary goods? It's the LDCs, it's the poorest country. So for God's sake, let's look at it. Should we forbid the global value chains? Obviously not, you cannot. But it changes all the way we are looking at trade policy and what we are supposed to be doing, and what are the rules at the multilateral level. 
So I think it would be useful to have the political goal to make sure that global value chains are acceptable, accessible to everybody and helps all countries to take their part in the value chain of the world. I think that is a political objective that, uh, uh, that UN can define. We cannot define that at WTO because everybody will think, oh my God, I'm going to lose that, I'm going to win that or whatever, and they cannot have a vision. But they will be able, if they have a political mandate, to see what that means for the process. The third element is as and d We have already started the discussion. I, I agree and disagree with the lady who made the intervention that as and d is just a, a plot for negotiations. I agree because I think that's the way it is used very much so. I disagree because I think as and d is an important element, a, a, a important element of the multilateral system. However, as and d has to be redefined. As and D is based on a philosophy or on a world that is not existing anymore. As and D provides certain things which are useful for development, and they, are, they provide certain things which are negative for development. Negative for the development are exclusions of the rules. If you are excluded from best practices, if you don't have to implement best practices, you are not going to be in the global value chain. An investor is not asking whether you have an exemption at the WTO or not. Either the conditions are right or they are wrong, and if they are wrong, he goes away. So that also brings us to the second question that was discussed, the link between domestic policies and international agreements. The international the multilateral agreements should help us to do at home what is actually in our own interest. That's the role. We need this additional pressure from the outside to do it. I can give you an example. I was a negotiator of Switzerland in agriculture. I can assure you that's not an easy post to be in. <laughs> uh, to defend the undefendable, you know, uh, it's not easy. But it was fun. Uh, but we also used the whole system, you know, to get the pressure inside the country to, to change. And we have changed in our agricultural policy. Not enough. I fully agree with you before you say it. But we have gone in the right direction and we are trying to go it. Without the external pressure, we would not have been able to do it. And I think that's what's the sense... The sense of the multilateral system is not to give flexibilities to countries. I hate this word. We need, we need policy space. No, you don't need policy space. You need policy space to do the right thing, but not the wrong thing. So I think we have to define the policy space so that you can do what is necessary for sustainable development. That would be the job of the uh, GSDs. Uh, the last point I wanted to, to, to bring in is uh, the non-trade concerns. I mean, there's a big ho hot potatoes in WTO always. You know, labor standards, environmental standards, or whatever you want. These are issues we got to address. We got to address them because whether we address them multilaterally or not, they will be there. And then they will be defined by a small group or by the importing country. And our purpose is to have a multilateral inclusive discussion of what that means. What is acceptable, what is actually trade distorting, and what is justified by the non-trade objectives in the process. That has to be a multilateral discussion. And if we refuse to discuss it in WTO, that means that it will be defined individually or uh, in smaller groups that are exclusive. So our objective is to create an environment that allows everybody to have to attain the sustainable development goals in environment, socially, economically, uh, environmentally, has the freedom to do it, but is doing it so that it's not hurting the other countries. So I think there are, I'm sure you can come up with many more, there are many of those issues that I think where we need a vision, a political vision, and where we have to force our negotiators in Geneva afterwards to see what they can do about it. Because they are not going to come up with that vision. That is a political vision and not a technical vision. Well, anyway, I've been speaking too long and I just wanted to, uh, to make a few remarks at the beginning. And uh, we have now a panel of three people, you know, who are in that business <laughs> directly and who will be able uh, to, to, to speak about. Well, they have all a topic. We have about good 10 minutes for each person and then uh, we have a discussion. 
I start with uh, Carsten Steinfeld from WTO. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you to Alice and Ricardo for their kind invitation to be here today. Um, I guess from the from the WTO perspective, uh, the way I'd like to to look at this topic is from two perspectives, in, in reflecting largely the two functions I see for the post-2015 development agenda, broadly speaking. One of them, one important function or, or role that the post-2015 development agenda can play with regard to trade, I think is in serving as, in, as an organizing framework, and I think it's, it's Friedrich who, who mentioned that already serving as an overarching framework to help us understand, well, where does trade fit into sustainable development? I think that's a, that's a very important first step and, and potential contribution that the post-2015 development agenda can make to uh, policy making on the ground. And I'll have a few things to say about that uh, to begin with. And then I think the second important function that, that uh, uh, an agenda like this can, can do for trade is to increase the likelihood that we will actually have efforts mobilized, both at the WTO and at the domestic level, in order to actually bring about change, to actually use trade as a tool for sustainable development. And I've been asked by, by Alice to focus more uh, concretely on how, how that can happen for least developed countries or in the LDC context. So I will have a few things to say, to say about that as well. But let me start then with some of the very broad key messages that are coming or that we see here in, the, in Geneva coming out, especially from the SDGs, but more broadly from the post-2015 development agenda. And I think there, there are four main main um, messages, I would call them. The first one, and I think this is very important and touches on something that Nicolas already mentioned, is where does trade fit into the sustainable development paradigm? And I think here, uh, negotiators were very clever in a way following the approach to Rio, of Rio plus 20 in saying trade is a cross-cutting means of implementation. So it's important for all the goals that are listed in the agenda. It's under goal. Trade is one of the four elements, together with uh, finance, with uh, technology, and with capacity building, as a cross-cutting means of implementation, relevant to, every, to attaining to the attainment of every uh, goal in the agenda. That's one, I think, very important message to keep in mind. The second one, and which is aspirational, is that multilateral cooperation is seen as the way to ensure that the role of trade for sustainable development is maximized. I think the, the realities on the ground, of course, are, are often not reflecting that, but I think the, the principle, the aspiration that is coming out of the SDGs is, there, is that one. We see lots of reference references to multilateral processes, both under negotiation and already uh, completed. We see a goal, a target, excuse me, devoted specifically to the multilateral trading system and promoting that uh, system. So clearly this is seen as a, as a key uh, aspirational goal. The third uh, element, of course, which has been with us for a long time and, and is now transposed into the uh, SDG or, or post-2015 development agenda is the issue of trying to continue catering to the needs of the least developed countries. Of course, this was already part of the MDGs and certainly is, is, uh, is very much in the center of the trade elements of the, uh, of the, of the SDGs. And finally, I think the fourth element is the idea that trade has to be part of coherent policy frameworks for sustainable development. I think this is something that's often overseen, but one important message that's coming out, uh, and, and specifically, is the fact that trade has to be part of broader, coherent 
um, policy packages, if you will. And, and, this, and we're already not staying uh, in the case of the SDGs at that very general level, but we're being given concrete examples of where trade policy reform can actually help attain uh, certain objectives, uh, certain goals. We have the case of uh, export competition in the case of the goal on hunger. We have the case of uh, trade distorting subsidies in the fishery sector. Uh, uh, as a way to then uh, reform them and, and, and get gains on the ocean conservation front. And we have several other examples. So this already we're getting some useful uh, guidance on how to, what coherence means, in fact, in the trade policy context. And I think that is uh, also quite important. Now, moving on and more specifically to the issue of mobilizing policy efforts in uh, or, or to the advantage of making trade work better for the LDCs. The way the, the current, the emerging framework is trying to deal with this issue is through in three main areas, the way I see it. First of all, there is the area of market access. Then there is the emphasis on exports. And then there is the, the broadly speaking, the whole area of um, flexibilities and, and technical assistance, special and differential treatment. So let me say a few things about each of these, these uh, areas. First of all, with regard to market access, of course, this reflects a very important issue that is that unilateral action alone will not be sufficient for any countries, let alone LDCs, in order to use trade as a, as a policy development, as a development uh, policy tool. Of course, the, the, the extent or the ability of countries to use trade as a development policy tool will in part depend on the market access conditions that they face in other countries. So the SDGs are quite clear in, in, and, and, and have in fact some, uh, point out some specific ways in which this issue can be addressed. They mentioned the issue of duty-free, quota-free uh, market access and the issue of, uh, as Alice mentioned, uh, rules of origin. Now, this are, these are areas in which already quite significant progress, in fact, has been already made at the WTO. We have nearly all developed countries uh, granting full or nearly full duty-free, quota-free uh, market access. And we have a number of developing countries having made uh, significant uh, efforts in this, this regard. So uh, this is an area where we already have significant uh, uh, progress, also with the recent uh, Bali uh, decision to have some uh, multilaterally, multilateral agreed guidelines that can make the rules of origin uh, as applied to LDCs more simple and more transparent. So here we see an area that is uh, that has already made, made significant progress. Um, some comments, and not necessarily implying that this is something that the agenda needs to reflect, because I think a lot of work uh, will be up to, in fact, to each policy com community to start putting on uh, or, or, or working on a narrative on how to implement all these different aspects of the agenda. But one thing that one could uh, mention very briefly is the fact that the market access view that's emerging from the uh, SDGs is very much focused on tariffs as presenting a barrier to, to trade for LDC or a barrier to exports. And this is only part of the story, of course. We know that tariffs, yes, can be an important barrier, but there is also a very important role being played as a binding constraint for LDC exports, which is non-tariff measures, of course. There is a whole uh, lot of NTMs out there, and their, their uh, role as determinants of market access has been increasing in recent uh, times. So this is an issue that if we want to improve market access for LDCs, the issue of non-tariff measures is one that has to be also kept in mind. The second issue I think that has to be kept in mind is the SDGs and in particular their market access element is very much focused on goods trade, access, exports of goods uh, from LDCs to other markets. And I think we, 
we would be foregoing an import many trade opportunities if we were not focusing also on the issue of services, right? Services have the advantage that they have proven very, very resilient in the context of the recent uh, crisis. While goods trade fell drastically, many services sectors proved very, very resilient. And of course, uh, services exports have been growing uh, quite dynamically in most areas of the world. So clearly here there is a, a very important opportunity for LDCs in order to uh, make progress in this area. And at WTO this is fully recognized. The recent uh, Bali decision of course took, a, took a, an important decision on the services waiver, trying to opera operationalize the services waiver. And recently in the, um, in the WTO there were over 25 uh, uh, members that actually indicated the, the services, uh, the services sectors and the modes of supply that they would be willing to uh, liberalize or, or provide preferential access to for least developed countries. So there has been progress here on this front as well at the WTO. Let me um, very uh, briefly also mention before I, I I have to stop the issue of exports, right? Exports is another big area where, um, of emphasis of the uh, sustainable development goals. There is a, a specific goal to double the exports of uh, least developed countries uh, by 2030, which is a, a goal that comes from the uh, Istanbul Program of Action. And I think, of course, this is, this is a key uh, topic uh, to, to, to emphasize for for, the, for uh, an agenda like the SDGs with a focus on, on least developed countries. What, what is important when one starts thinking about the implementation of this specific item or the, the, in thinking about how to meet this subject is to recognize that this, uh, uh, this goal is as much about imports as it is about exports. It's, a, it's as much about domestic policies as, is, as it is about policies in, in uh, foreign markets. And why do I say that? Well, for the reasons that were, have already been alluded to, I think in, in practice what we see is that country or firms that are trying to enter export markets or that tr are trying to maintain their trade competitiveness will need access to the most, to the best quality and, and lowest uh, uh, or cheapest, uh, cheapest inputs. And this Sometimes these inputs will be available in the domestic market, but many times these inputs will only be available through imports. So a way to actually increase and maintain trade competitiveness is to maintain an open uh, uh, trading regime vis-a-vis -vis those, uh, those imports that are essential for, uh, for your export competitiveness. Um, and this is, this is an issue, obviously, that, that uh, will require further, further consideration. Um, let me just uh, finish, since I think I'm, I have run out of time. I think it's important to, as we, we look at the, the months ahead, there is room for um, incorporating some of these ideas or some of these, um, these uh, complementary issues into the agenda through the uh, work on the indicators, the ongoing work on, on indicators that is... Uh, for which the technical work is just now starting. Many, there could be a number of indicators reflecting, for example, the issue of the non-tariff measures that are being, um, that are confronting LDC exports in foreign markets. That could be a way to measure progress along uh, certain targets. And I think more broadly, it's also important to uh, start thinking or, or possibly think about ways about how the WTO, which has a, a significant um, experience in the area of trade policy review and, and monitoring, how that institutional experience could perhaps feed into the review and monitoring framework in the context of the SDGs. Uh, this is also, I think, important in order not to focus too narrowly the agenda on just specific WTO uh, negotiating processes, but to maintain some sort of dynamic coherence and allow issues emerging, even if there are technical issues emerging in the WTO, to um, 
transpire uh, to the uh, post-2015 development agenda. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carsten, and thank you very much for putting emphasis on, on services and anti-bees which have not been uh, covered. And I think the idea of the TPRM, you know, which is basically an exercise to look at the environment, you know, uh, for, for trade in a country, it would be a good idea to look into because basically trade is an instrument, it's not a goal, it is an instrument to achieve the sustainable development goals. So that I think may be something we should further discuss. But before we go into the discussion, let me go to our second speaker, which is Marcus Bartley-Jones from the World Bank. Uh, please, John. Thanks very much, uh, Nicola, and thanks uh, to ICTSD for this opportunity. I think for the bank it's really valuable to have events like this. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us on a panel to talk, but it's really an important opportunity for, for us to listen to the kind of ideas that we have um, particularly on, on an important multilateral process like this one, so uh, I do welcome the invitation to be here. Uh, the bank is involved uh, quite heavily in, in a number of dimensions of the post-2015 process, uh, but two in particular. Uh, we've been involved uh, steadily uh, in work within the UN system on refining the indicators, uh, and we've also been heavily involved in the financing for development discussions along, particularly with the IMF and other multilateral development banks. But what I'd like to do very briefly um, today and looking at the clock running down rapidly is just touch uh, on two, two ideas. Um, one is this idea of what trade as an enabler for the rest of the goals, uh, or, or for the goals rather, means. And then the other is what all this means in concrete implementation terms at the national level, which is where the World Bank does most of its work. So in that context, uh, to, to start with what trade as an enabler for the SDGs means, I think we, we have a daunting table um, like the one we've got on the screen here um, that, that serves a, a useful function of listing a number of issues and pulling out particular trade-related ideas as they relate uh, across the goals. But I, I think this is useful, but I think what's more useful for us to do, and we've touched on this in a number of comments so far, is to take a step back um, and to see See, to ask uh, the question of ourselves of what role trade-related policies can have in achieving the kind of vision that is set out in the SDGs. This is about not so much an exercise of running through individual goals and seeing where we, we might find trade. It's about really seeing trade in terms of uh, the way it's conceived in Goal 17 uh, or was uh, in MDG 8 in the Millennium Development Goals. What, what is trade as a means of implementation? Uh, and I think when we take this step back, um, we, we give ourselves a useful new frame of reference rather than trying to run through and, and spot trade in each of the individual, individual goals. We might be a little bit disappointed if we run through and, and look for trade, try to find it everywhere in, in 1 to 17, um, but by taking this step back we, we do, um, we'll find trade everywhere. Just to give a couple of examples, in terms of goal 1, uh, ending poverty, trade integration is absolutely uh, an essential contributor to growth which helps boost incomes and create jobs through new market opportunities. We know that for MDG 1 trade openness and integration was a critical part of the achievement of that goal and so of course it's, it's a question we'll have to ask ourselves for Sustainable Development Goal 1 as well. In terms of ending hunger uh, in Goal 2 there is this mention of distortions in agricultural <laughs> markets uh, these are, of course, important, but there's a wide range of other trade and investment related actions that are going to be essential in achieving this goal. We know that agricultural trade costs are significantly higher than they are in manufacturing. Uh, this is from World Bank and UN Economic and Social Commission of the Asia-Pacific Research. Um, we know strikingly that they haven't fallen since the 1990s, unlike trade costs in manufacturing. This indicates that there's a very wide agenda agricultural trade to, to this specific goal here. And again, we need to look not just at barriers in export markets and policies that affect international markets, we need to look at barriers that countries might impose themselves. Recent work that the World Bank has done in Africa, for example, shows that one of the significant barriers to increased agricultural productivity on the continent are, are barriers that countries themselves are imposing, non-tariff measures uh, on things like seeds and fertilisers that, uh, if those are addressed, could significantly improve agri agricultural productivity. So the point here, um, we could run through all of the goals and perform a similar exercise, but it's to sit back and, and think about how a wide range of trade-related policies are going to be relevant across them all. 
I think we also need to take a step back and think about what kind of global economy we're going to require to achieve the goals. Uh, and, and I think, hinting at this already across a number of comments, we're going to need an integrated one. We're going to need one where uh, there are, is an open flow of ideas, of innovation, of technology, of goods and services, of investment. It's not going to be good enough to, for countries to try and pursue the achievement of these goals in isolation from the rest of the world. The, the WTO is going to have a, a crucial role in underpinning this kind of system in, in multilateral, of multilateral governance, but obviously other institutions will too. And that's going to be a question that we need to think of further. Then at the country level, this is the second point that I'd like to touch on. Um, developing countries seeking to achieve the kind of vision set out in the goals are obviously going to need to apply the best uh, solutions from around the world to take advantage of the kind of global economy we have in mind for their development. And uh, here I think the key point to make is that we, we wouldn't assume that any country would pick up the texts as they end up, either the Financing for Development or Sustainable Development Goals text, and see that automatically as a blueprint for their own development. Of course, and, and, and this was the point that Friedrich made right at the beginning, it stems from the mandate for these negotiations, these are going to be tailored at the national level. Countries themselves, with help from international partners, will look at specifically what needs to be done in their own context and on trade, it's going to go well beyond what is in the text of the goals or indeed the financing for development draft. There are two particular elements here that I was asked to touch on um, that come up in the financing for development text, uh, which are trade related World Bank uh, indicate that the transport infrastructure investments required in that region are between $411 and $691 billion between now and 2020. So when we look at that, uh, it's clear that public financing alone is not going to meet a challenge like that. Uh, private financing is going to have a huge role, as is cooperation between the two. The latest data that we have uh, shows that there was about $29 billion in private financing for infrastructure worldwide in 2013. So presenting that against the gap for South Asia for one region makes it clear that uh, on the private side there's a large gap as well. It means we need to look at ways of leveraging public funding more effectively for private financing for infrastructure. This is an area that the World Bank has been working on a lot in the financing for development process along with others. It's something where action can, at the global level can make a difference, but what our research and experience shows is that ultimately for potential private sector investors, the key determinant of whether they invest or not uh, is not a shortage of finance on the supply side, but it's a perception of political risk and of a weak business climate in the potential investment destination. So this ties into the ideas of, uh, of national governments themselves having a great deal of the responsibility with help from, from international partners uh, in, in achieving the vision set out in the SDGs. Just very briefly on trade facilitation, which was the other element I was asked to speak uh, specifically on. Uh, this is a very large part of the work that the World Bank does uh, on, at the national level for countries to help them achieve their development goals. And so it's fitting that it's reflected in, in the financing for development text. Uh, we think that implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement can form the core of developing countries' trade facilitation reform programs. That's why we've mobilised significant new financial assistance and others have as well um, for achieving that. We know that it's it's one of the weakest areas of performance for many developing countries and one of the key barriers that limit their businesses from connecting to international markets. Uh, there are a number of other issues, of course, that we would um, be encouraging governments to look at when they try to translate the vision of these development goals into practice at the national level in terms of trade. And services, non-tariff measures uh, have been mentioned already by Carsten. Links between trade and the investment climate are hugely important, um, as I mentioned already, in terms of infrastructure and particularly in terms of connectivity to value chains. And there are many others as well. But I think the key point to take away from this is that uh, the agenda needs to be determined at the national level. Governments will need to look more widely than just what they find on trade in the texts themselves to decide the path forward. And just one final point uh, on, on how we can design policies most effectively and also monitor the achievement of the goals is we have a huge gap in global data and transparency on trade-related policies, but more widely on many of the areas set out in the SDGs. Just to give one example, um, in, in many countries where the poorest people are concentrated, 
We know that between 50, 80, in some cases even higher percentage of the economy is the informal sector. Uh, and we have basically no data <laughs> on, on the informal economy. It's very, very hard to design policies that are going to be effective if they're targeted only at 30, 40, 50 percent of economic activity in the country. And that's something that will cut across all of the SDGs. Um, we'll need a much greater global effort to publicise data, to, to gather it in the first place, disseminate it more widely if uh, we're going to achieve the goals. I think I'll leave it there. Um, we've got a wide-ranging agenda, but hopefully we can pick up one more in questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thank you for having put uh, into the relation the international environment and the domestic uh, co cooperation and the importance of infrastructure. And I think one of the issues which was very nice, which you didn't touch, but I think you might want to say a few words about this, the, this policy of, of trade corridors, you know, where you are trying to use the infrastructure both for integration worldwide, but also to have the regional integration, which is very important. And the fact that you have mentioned the informal economy, which we always ignore, you know, uh, because not because we want to ignore them, but because we don't have any data, I think is an important factor uh, and useful. Concerning infrastructure financing, you, 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 I have good news for you. You will get some help there from your competitor, the Asian Infrastructure Bank. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, not, not a competitor, I have to clarify. We're very, very welcome. There's more than enough infrastructure gap to go around. Thanks. Uh, we come to uh, last but not least the, uh, the presentation of Harsha Singh. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Just a few uh, comments. First of all, deep appreciation for the previous two presentations. I think they made a lot of very substantive points. Uh, a few comments on especially the one which our uh, chairperson made about the diminishing role of WTO. And uh, you said that today trade rules are made outside. Actually, even earlier they were made outside. And they were brought to the WTO. Uh, today the difficulty is how to bring those rules to WTO. That's the key difficulty. There are reasons for that, but this is not the forum to discuss that. The other thing is, it's very important uh, what Friedrich uh, mentioned, that the SDGs are actually aspirations, uh, and they are at a very general level, and we actually, the next step, what Alice uh, talked about in the table was the implementation part in the FFD, in, in the chart behind, uh, is to actually give it more meaning. However, when I look at SDGs, it's a combination, it's a mishmash. It's aspirations, and it's also very specific steps. And uh, there are a number of places where if I really put my imagination to work, I can see trade working through various kind of uh, contexts. But it's not clear whether these people have actually thought about that uh, at all. And the clearest is when I look at the segment on trade itself. Uh, where uh, there are three items and uh, they are focused primarily from the perspective of LDCs or, or very poor countries uh, and the services waiver is missing as uh, the first uh, speaker pointed out. The other part is that if you do not include services in trade, how do you then interpret the the objective of significantly increase exports of developing countries in particular with a view to doubling the least developed countries' share of global exports. So is it goods or is it goods and services? So I think some clarity needs to be brought into this kind of uh, uh, discussion, even if it's at an aspirational level. So that's, that's very important. Uh, now I take, take a step back and, and address the, the issue which, uh, uh, or the points which I, I have to uh, talk about, which link up with the mega regionals. Before looking at the mega regionals, we have to understand that trade today is a very different uh, phenomena than it was even 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, there was a July framework uh, for the Doha round which gave uh, meaning to what 
would be the context of negotiations. And that's, some people blame that framework for difficulty. I don't think that's, that's necessarily correct. It contributed. But today, trade, uh, the chairman talked about global value chains. Very valid point. But today, trade, investment, global value chains, services, and technology are increasingly overlapping. And we cannot look at policy without really understanding these links. So once I see that, actually the scope of trade policy is far wider than conventionally understood. And the efforts through mega regionals are precisely to deal with this change. So there are two kinds of efforts through the, the mega regionals. One is that uh, they, they are trying to build new rules for the, their understanding of a new reality. At the same time, they are trying to, there is an increased competition in the world. The reason why we got outside uh, decisions into WTO earlier was that the large, largest two economies were the bulk of international trade. Today, <laughs> today they comprise about 50%, give and take a little bit here or there. So, but the growth of the, of the other economies, the emer so-called emerging economies, is posing a competitive uh, challenge to them. And a number of industrials in those economies feel that this is due to different rules. The rules which actually represent what ought to be appropriate policy in their perspective, what ought to be globally agreed standards for, for uh, carrying out uh, investment and production, sustainable development, social standards, etc. So once you see that, it's also uh, an effort at bringing out a level playing field, and it's an effort to emphasize value systems of certain part of this global society on markets in an incremental manner. So that's what if we, if we understand mega regionals from that perspective, we will know where they are going. And as uh, it was pointed out, as in, uh, through global value chains, you're linked with these markets, you have to meet those regulations. So if these markets which are developing are developing in a manner which is not inclusive of fragmenting the world trade uh, system, then we have some trouble because bulk of the countries are outside the mega regionals. I'm not even counting TISA, but even if I count TISA, uh, if I take the three main mega regionals, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TTIP, uh, between EU and US, and RCEP, which has uh, ASEAN plus six. That's just about 40 countries. So we have, a, uh, of 49 countries, we have about 110 WTO members outside this. The entire Africa is outside it. And what is happening today is that it's not just non-tariff me measures. There are m various kinds of non-tariff measures. <coughs> but even when you're conducting fair trade, unrestricted or not disguised protection trade, with valid uh, value systems being reflected, you have to meet those higher standards. And v global value chains imply that <laughs> private standards or the lead firms in value chains become crucial. So we have these aspirations in SDGs, which are required because I, I think even if they don't give you uh, iron cast rights, they do give you the right to question an action on the basis of these principles. It's a very important development because they give you a parameter to test whether the action of some nation imp imp with important implications is, is income for your understanding of conformity with SDGs or not. So it's an advance on some kind of move which uh, takes the world towards uh, sustainable development goals. But once we have that, then we must have those principles reflected in every effort which has a large impact on the world. 
and these mega regionals do have a large impact. Uh, another very important point which our chairman talked about was that WTO has to fix the principles of mega regionals. Actually, those principles could also be fixed outside the WTO in the SDG context. Suppose one says everywhere inclusive systems must be made. Inclusion is a very powerful concept. When I look at SDGs, there are actually some goals which include the word inclusive or inclusion. But when I read those goals, it's not what I'm talking about. It's about just a very narrow coverage of some issue as inclusion. So it's extremely important. You cannot stop the, the movement of mega regionals. It's there. It's going to happen. Maybe this year, maybe in five years, but it will come because the global trading system demands it. I didn't say the multilateral trading system. Ultimately, because so many countries are out of it, the, the global trade will demand that it moves to multilateral trading system. So we have to find ways of doing that. So some kind of credibility has to be added to SDGs by recognizing the fact that it's in, in some sense limited, not uh, adequately covering issues of interest even for LDCs. And when we're, they are talking about inclusion, which is in many places, I don't think even if trade is taken as a tool which is cross-cutting, you're not really addressing the systems which will determine trade in the world through inclusion. So we have to think of that. And when I read it the first time, there's a provision on implementing the public health provision of the, the TRIPS agreement. The same countries which are saying it must be implemented have it within their rights to implement it in WTO, and they haven't done it till today. So where is the credibility of this? We have to make these efforts credible. I've talked of various ways in which more effort needs to be done. But as, as far as mega regionals is concerned, it's not inclusive for various reasons. I'll just mention that. And if I take a step back and say, OK, for my development goals, what do I need? I need finance to implement. I need market access conditions, which are allowing me to benefit uh, by uh, selling my product. And since it's global value chains, it would involve uh, importing, processing, adding value, uh, uh, diversification, etc. Actually, value chains are mentioned in the SDGs. If you take a look at 9.3, value chains are mentioned. <coughs> If you take a look at 9.1, trans-border investment is mentioned. So conceptually, it's there, but it's not there in a very clear context, at least not in the context of trade, investment, global value chain, services, and technology together. Then we need cooperation, development cooperation. Yes, we need all other kinds of funding, because without that, the gap won't be filled. But this document or this initiative is also about making sure that development cooperation efforts which are going down are revived for a common good of the world. So we need that. And at the same time, we also need uh, international economic conditions which don't jeopardize whatever the poorer countries are doing. Look at the financial crisis. Countries which had nothing to do with it just went down the tube. So efforts to prevent that are, are taking place. But at the same time, one should develop some kind of insurance mechanisms for the poorer countries against that. Something by G20 was done, uh, and trade facilitation, etc. There's no mention of trade, uh, trade finance for developing countries. That's, who needs it most? The, develop, uh, the, the poorer countries. So I, I think this is, a, this is a document which could have been written 20 years ago. It's not a forward-thinking document. It's not even a current document. <coughs> and what will say, let me take TPP, because I think RCEP will have lower standards than TPP. TTIP has some time to come into place. 
many people doubt whether and when it will come into place. I, I think uh, probably in a few years' time it will be there, but TPP is likely to come much earlier. It will uh, lead to greater tariff reduction with rules of origin which are exclusionary. So if you have tariff preferences, there's preference erosion. It will imply higher standards. It will emphasize facilitation of value chains also. So within that uh, restricted market, so to say excluded, exclusionary market, facilitation of value chains will grow. When that happens, the dominant firms in that region will become even more powerful in the value chains. And dominant firms have their own standards, the lead firms. And down the value chain, these standards have to apply. And what are the contents of these standards? Definitely they are sustainable development and social standards. So not only will there be focus on such objectives, the impact the, in terms of the actual market interaction uh, in uh, value chains will emphasize these, these private standards. And the, the important part about private standards is they are higher than most mandatory standards and they keep increasing in scope. So we are now thinking of a system which is not only going to be exclusionary to begin with, it will become even more difficult to be part of it for the poorer countries. So enhancing capacities in a very meaningful way becomes very important. The question about S&D from the standards perspective uh, uh, is important. Actually, standards ha have no S&D. Either you meet the standard and sell it, sell your product, or you don't, don't link up to the value chain. That's it. So, okay. so, the, the, so what can we do? We can think of rules of origin. We can think of providing the best treatment which the TPP provides to its uh, participants, to LDCs, uh, including facilitation. We can uh, think of building grounds for some kind of platform for addressing uh, and making more coherent the uh, private standards. There are efforts going on. More focus needs to be done there. And definitely, we need very focused assistance to upgrade capacity and help with trade finance as well as uh, implementing the services part, which, which is very important. Because uh, today, servicification of manufacturers shows that uh, poorer countries actually may find it more easy uh, in value addition to uh, link uh, their current uh, products with the services capacity which they may build. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harsha. I think uh, this was a very important uh, addition to it. I think a, a lot, I mean, has to be seen that it, it goes around this, uh, this, plural, this plurilateral, these mega deals and, and uh, global value chains, etc. I must say, I hate global, uh, no, I hate uh, exclusive systems like TPP and so on as, as much as you, but for different reasons. Quite frankly said, I think we need a distribution of tasks. The WTO cannot, in my opinion, do what the TPPs are doing. TPPs are about deep integration. We cannot do deep integration with 167 countries. You need a smaller group that has a similar, whatever it is, uh, social values or, or whatever you called it. That's within the facts of life. So. We cannot, we cannot avoid that. We cannot avoid the, 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 those deals. But what we can do is, I think you mentioned it also, to put the rules you know, under which ones we do. You commit yourself as a government that if I participate <coughs> in one of those exclusive deals, I respect a certain number of principles. And those principles, you know, we can use the SDG, you know, uh, uh, partly at least. But I do think it has to be in WTO, because if it's not in WTO, you don't have the sanction. And we need the sanction, otherwise I forget about it, uh, of, of the value. Now, is SDG 
Uh, pardon. Uh, are those mega deals uh, really a way of promoting uh, the values of a certain countries? I think yes, partly it is. But partly, if you look at the SDGs, most of those values are in the SDGs and they are agreed uh, by everybody. I mean, all the questions about labor standards, about uh, so, uh, the social development, about inclusiveness, about uh, environment, they are in the SDGs. So I think in a lot of ways we can say they are global, sta uh, global standards. Now, how they are applied, that's a thing. So I don't think we should worry about the setting of standards in those things, but more about the use of the standards, because there is no question that often those standards are used in the name of non-trade objectives, but in reality they are trying to get rid of a comparative advantage in the South. And that we have to regulate, otherwise we are in trouble. Concerning private uh, sector uh, status, I, I have actually wondered, you know, I'm talking here for LDC smaller countries. We are always speaking against that, but that might be a fantastic thing for them. Because those are relatively small production uh, groups. You know, if they can follow, they follow one standard, it's enough for all their products, and they get a real comparative advantage to the others. So I wonder whether we shouldn't see actually those private standards not also as an opportunity for those smaller uh, poor developing countries to single out their products from the rest of the mass production from China and the other emerging countries. Uh, but I think those are elements that uh, we, we can discuss and I want to now certainly open the floor uh, both to the people here and then to the web, uh, whatever Broadcast. it's called. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. To whom can I give the floor? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, well, uh, good evening. Uh, all the distinguished speakers, it was a wonderful presentation by all of you, and uh, which provided us with a deep insight into not only issues that are within the realm of WTO, but also those which are covered by other organizations and with reference to the MGDs, MDGs. So uh, coming first uh, and the most important aspect is that we heard a lot about uh, uh, WTO functioning. We have no doubt that still it is a rules-based organization system and it must be preserved and it must continue functioning as it has been in the past. Without uh, touching what is basic the right now, the daunting challenge that is that the WTO is faced with, we, uh, as rightly pointed out by Sir Nicholas, uh, that it is basically uh, sort of a mercantilist thinking sort of the, uh, issues or so we always talk about trade liberalization in terms of reduction of trade barriers and other things. I think the fundamental question is not that. The fundamental question is re-regulation. Re-regulating through rules. And that is the point which is very important and where we do not really address the question exactly. That it's not a matter of tearing the borders down in terms of tariffs or non-tariff barriers, but it's a matter of re-regulating exactly and trying to come across new rules where, which are workable, doable, and which provide a level playing field to all the WTO members. Of course, we, where we wanted to succeed, the TFA is in front of you. It's, 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 although it's a best endeavor thing, but still it's workable. Coming next to SND, uh, SND, I don't know exactly uh, uh, how would uh, Sir Harsha uh, further educate us in terms of quantifying that SND was really 
how how when how far did it really went in terms of success because most of the sd is couched in best endeavor language and rather than solid foundation and my last one is with reference to uh, again there's a nexus with reference to re-regulation means you need rules you need negotiations on them you need to bring up update the rule book and that's that's where you end up with uh, trade as a development model but development needs investment and investing and investment means when we are talking of that we are talking of sustainable investment because sustainable investment would be the only panacea to all these global value chains and other things because if there is no sustainable investment there won't be a long lasting uh, uh, result that one, outcome one could really get into this. Uh, Although we heard a lot about sustainable development and but we would like to I'm more eager to know exactly about sustainable investment that how would you ensure this that what policy measures or practices could be given to this important issue which has been ignored for some time. Thank you. I think that's working now. My name is Catherine Hagen with the Global Social Observatory. This has really been a fascinating uh, panel discussion. And I just want to follow up on what uh, the previous questioner uh, raised. And that is that uh, if you look at the trade provisions in the means of implementation, uh, you, one tries to figure out which ones of them are in fact actually going to increase resources. I mean, they are things to remove barriers there are things to remove subsidies. There are things to provide access. And yet what you need in terms of connecting that to anything realistic is resources to take advantage of that, which means investment. And, and so to me, something is going on here that needs more attention, which is how you link the trade measures with the investment measures. And in the FFD document in particular, you see this language that is coming out that uh, for, you need to increase both the uh, ODA and the other domestic resource mobilization and other foreign mobilization from the uh, World Bank and other uh, international financial institutions. But you also need more involvement of the private sector with rules about how the private sector engagement will operate. So there are, there are these provisions of respect for certain basic principles if the private sector is going to be brought into that. Now, where is all of this going to happen? I mean, there was early on a lot of talk about trying to integrate into the WTO a system that would manage the rules about investment globally, but that's not in the cards. But I think there needs to be something, and both Marcus and Harsha talked about this importance of the link between investment and uh, facilitation. So infrastructure is certainly one of those areas where you need to be looking at this. But as Harsha mentioned, it's also tied in with technology. So you've got technology, capacity, services, all of that. Are there, where, are there areas where you can look at the coordination of all of these things in an effective way to advance policy coherence that, in fact, does result in effective mobilization of additional resources? Thank you, uh, Fernando Pimentel from the Brazilian delegation to the WTO. Um, just two, two points. One, um, as I hear here, we're speaking, you know, especially about trade. Um, it seems, you know, gives me an idea how hard it must have been to craft the whole, uh, the whole goals, because probably the same room filled with people, specialists in environment, will say this is old, this is totally obsolete. The environment is, you know, much the, 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 the solutions are, are we need much more advanced, etc. So one. I think one important aspect of all this is to sort of, and that's what the Millennium Development Goals did, you sort of focus different areas into one um, sort of 
this is broader but set of goals uh, the millennial Deven development goals had the had the 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 amazing achievement of making almost every un agency including the world bank which was very very independent um even the imf look at one one sort of of of, of target sort of focus attention and in this i think uh, um, this aspirational uh, um, part of the of the sdgs are very important going to trade um uh, that, that's one thing that you no know, sort of bothers me um, when I hear people here in, in Geneva, especially WTO, saying, "Look, um, the the people who are just talking about this, they're out of the loop. The world is going on. There's a march of progress. We have um, the uh, uh, the global value chains are the new thing to be, and everybody has to has to has to go there and try to happening. It's true. It is." But it's not happening alone. It's not happening in a vacuum. There are many things happening at the same time. We have the environment. Uh, we have the the investment. The investment uh, uh, um, sort of scenario is changing too, and not necessarily. There's not a sort of a single march um, uh, towards a, a greater liberalization. It's more like a dance. Uh, you see governments um, trying to regulate more and successfully regulating more. Um, it started with systemic issues in the financial market but now it's going to you know uh, BAPS which is governments trying to really get their money out of uh, corporations um, for you know trying to avoid uh, um, uh, tax evasion etc and this is a really high in the political agenda um, and it, it will invest so um, it's not correct to think that you no know, whatever global value chains want they get there is a lot of, uh, of, of, of pushing and jostling and many things will shape the future so it would be so just a cautionary note not to, you know, fall into the hubris of, you know, these uh, people in designing the, the goals are, are completely out of the loop and we know what's going to happen because nobody knows. Thank you. One more question and then I think we make a, a, a two of responses. Yes. Yes. Um, well, at the opening, uh, Ricardo said that one of the objectives of ICTSD was to ensure that uh, the post-2015 uh, development agenda actually reflected 21st century uh, trade or 21st century issues. <laughs> That's a very tall <laughs> objective. So, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I think that, uh, that through the... You know the difficulty here is that the the, the negotiating dynamics of uh, of the SDGs have meant it so that um, it's like the dog chasing its tail. That uh, you know we don't we cannot focus on 21st century agenda issues because we haven't finished the 20th century's agenda issues, which are the MDGs and in the WTO reflected mostly through the uh, Doha Development Agenda and. Until we finish the Doha Development Agenda, we cannot fin we cannot focus on anything else. But we need to first finish the Doha Development Agenda, and we haven't finished the Doha. So it's an endless circle, and unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic that this will ever be broken, uh, because um, the, the 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 negotiators in 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 New York very, I mean, their their position was mostly. We cannot dictate on the WTO what their negotiating agenda will be. I mean, I'm not as valuing whether this is right or, or wrong, but that's the reality of what the, of what occurred in the negotiations. It was uh, the position of many of the of the countries, both developed and developing uh, uh, countries. So across uh, you know both uh, ends of uh, of uh, of, uh, of the development world. Uh, uh, there was consensus that uh, there shouldn't be any uh, dictating of uh, agenda to the WTO, and uh, um, Frederick was also saying that uh, the the um, the MDGs should not the SDGs should not look not look not be looked at the SDGs or sorry the MDGs 2.0, and unfortunately on trade uh, I don't think that the the SDGs are not even. MDGs 2.0, there are MDGs 1.2, because the same language that you have on the targets under the SDGs is the, exactly almost the same language that you have on the targets for the, for, for the MDGs. So we haven't really moved on that, uh, that agenda. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's uh, the, the, the dynamic of, uh, of it. Uh, so.
Yeah, you gave a good explanation of why it is like it, but it's not really. What is, what is your question? No, it was no, it's it's a not remark. a question, it was a comment. Alex, I see. Alex good. has a question. Yes, Alejandro. I hesitated very much whether to intervene or not because I feel I'm learning a lot here. Uh, being much younger, I don't have the breadth of experience that Nicolas has. <laughs> Two very brief comments. One, about the multilateral trading system and the vision, and, and Nicolas just said about how the, these goals embody a vision, as if the multilateral trading system did not. I do not agree with that necessarily because I think that the system embodies certain values, certain visions, which are there, are in the text of our agreement. Non-discrimination, trade liberalization, the rule of the law, it's mentioned here several times. So I think that, that there is that. And, and to the extent that it is shared and, and, and supplied, it, it's, it's, it's another question, but be what it is, it evolves slowly, etc. Now, a lot has been said about mega regionals, etc. And I'm not so concerned about countries that wanted to embody those, that vision, to liberalize their trade, etc. Go faster by other means, by other instruments. But I'll use Harsha's concept about inclusiveness. What I'm really worried about these agreements is that they are made possible because they're not inclusive, not in terms of their uh, membership, but they're not inclusive uh, in terms of their agenda. And here, I think it's quite simple. These agreements are made possible because they're not dealing with the Mexican support on agriculture, with export subsidies on agriculture, with anti-dumping, with fishery subsidies, and so on and so forth. So all these things which are highly sensitive politically, which demand a lot of political energy and support to solve, I don't said the 20th century problem, will lie there in spite of how fast, no matter how fast and deep, those mega regionals go. We will still have that agenda hanging over there, waiting to be solved. And the only way, the only place to solve it nowadays is in the WTO. So I'm, I'm picking up the concept of, of Hasha about the inclusiveness about the vision of the system, et cetera, and, and trying to say we do have a vision. We, we do have, the, the, no, we, we, we all share that vision. There is a sense of purpose. And, and right now, the mega regions are not necessarily fulfilling that in a very comprehensive way to solve the problems, which, by the way, affect the poor the most. Thank you very much. A good remark. Uh, I think we stop for the moment here and start. Uh, to, to give answers. Uh, who wants to start? I can start, but let's go the same way. Yeah, okay. Actually, I have answers to each one of them, so uh, I'll end up taking some time. Uh, one, uh, starting with the chairman's point of that value system, it's good. The issue is not that sustainable development and social standards are bad. The issue is are they being used, linked to trade in a manner uh, which result in what is uh, otherwise would be considered as uh, trade diversion? Yeah. So, but the, the issue of what is the standard is linked to this. Because you cannot have the second without also looking at the content of the standard. And what my point was that private standards will become a much larger used, a much more prevalent uh, phenomena. And the, what you fear will become more and more the reality. Uh, and private standards, there are <coughs> private standards, but what is required is to have the multiplicity of these standards into some kind of a, a coherent system, agreed, agreed principles. SDGs could pave the way for that. On, uh, 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 re-regulation through rules, I completely agree. In fact, the entire emphasis in the mega regionals is on rules. It's not about tariffs per se. Yes, there'll be in dramatic decrease in tariffs in TPP, not so in RCEP, but the bulk of it is rules. 90% is rules. Uh, how would you ensure sustainable investment through the same kind of standards as you ensure sustainable trade. In fact, if you see investment agreements, they have these principles ingrained in them. Uh, there's a joint declaration by EU and 
U.S. on investment agreements, which very much upfront talks about it. And it also talks about state enterprise reform, incidentally. So this is the same kind of con context. Uh, which ones are investment? Actually, if you go to uh, 16 and uh, goal uh, 17, uh, investment is all over, either directly or indirectly through building infrastructure within a nation, transboundary, et cetera. But 17 very clearly talks about funding, et cetera. And uh, you, you also have other aspects like technology capacity, uh, in improvement services, uh, et cetera, in various parts spread out. The point is, it doesn't come out in a very coherent manner. That, that was the point I was making. I can read into it because I know the subject. Maybe there is more to it because I don't know the entire subject. But at least if it is as open as that, somebody who has dealt with WTO dispute settlement will tell you anything could be done. And you, you won't be found in the wrong. So that's, that's the fungibility of that. Focus on different areas, uh, into focused attention. Yes, that's definitely uh, important if you can do it. Uh, it's the same phenomena as the Christmas tree we have in the Doha round. When you start saying, okay, let's now have the top five priorities. And everybody might have different top five priorities. So it's difficult, but perhaps some effort could be made there. Uh, we need to finish the Doha agenda. Yes, we need to finish it. But interestingly, world trade is going to be conducted more and more not by the Doha agenda. Because once these mega regionals come into place and they cover, if China has also started talking with EU and US, they have a dialogue going on and the Chinese trade minister said he's very happy with that dialogue. They have the, the free trade uh, areas, uh, zones, where they are actually implementing and preparing their system to meet the highest standards. So it's not just because Doha agenda is not finished that trade will be conducted according to that. Unfortunately, that is the, the crux of the problem. Doha agenda has, say, 160 countries. Only about 49, 50 countries will be defining the rules. And others will have to increase their capacity, et cetera. So uh, on the point on cannot dictate what will be in the negotiating agenda of WTO, also this point ab about how uh, New York uh, is sensitive uh, uh, about what happens in Geneva, the point is not that they should dictate to WTO what should be the agenda. That's WTO's task. The point is when you are formulating a framework which is as important as sustainable development goals, you need to have a com conceptual framework which looks at how the world is functioning. So it's not that uh, that uh, the link between uh, value chains, uh, investment, trade, services, etc., needs to ne necessarily be told to WTO that you must look at it. No. Also, global value chains will not get what they want. After all, they are, they are industries, and they interact with, with governments. But now governments are realizing that if they miss out on links with global value chains, so it's not a question of just recognizing that here is a lead firm, etc. There are two kinds of conflicts there. One is to try and make sure that you link up to that, and second is to make sure that the lead firm does not stop your process of value addition uh, on, on uh, the learning curve, because that is another worry. So governments can, can actually have policies and, and initiatives, innovation, uh, R&D, technology policies, etc., to do that domestically. Brazil has done it. Foxcom's uh, uh, investment in Brazil is, 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 is an example. So it's not that, and if you see what Brazil has done in the case of fabulous production where it invited the top six uh, uh, companies in the world, the focus was on value chains. It invited those which are lead in the chain. It didn't it didn't invite just anybody. So the policy planning which Brazil has done in that segment, that is the framework which we need to now look at the, the issues of trade, investment, value chains, 
uh, and technology as a whole. Uh, on uh, WTO has principles, definitely it has principles. They are not working. So <laughs> in the sense, the efforts which are there are not respecting them. They are exclusionary efforts. And the interesting thing about TPP is US has given a proposal of phasing out its exports, uh, agriculture export subsidies. Fishery subsidies are being negotiated. Something which, uh, you know, both Alex and I, we have given speeches where we said multilateral system is the only place where subsidies can be addressed. This is now changing. So if it is changing in that manner, okay, not fully changing, I agree. But when we see the world which is not inclusive developing this way, and trade we agreed is a cross-cutting issue. And these are the guys. Suppose China joins, you have three-fourths of world trade with, with TPP uh, standards and 110 countries outside it, whole of Africa outside it. It's a recipe for disaster. So that's, that's the concern which I have, which therefore the issue of inclusiveness must be emphasized. I, I will. I, I, will <laughs> I will address just a, a few points. I think the, the issue about uh, re-regulation versus trade liberalization, I think it, it's, it's um, mostly, I guess, a, a semantic issue because when one, one talks about trade liberalization, we might be using that as, as shorthand for a much more comprehensive process, I think, which involves, I think the, the best way to describe it is trying to reduce trade costs, your costs of connecting to global markets. I think that's the best way to describe it. And sometimes that might involve pure and simple liberalization, decreasing a tariff, but sometimes that, you very well said it, might involve regulation. Many of the a way to reduce your trade costs might be through better services sector. And that involves certainly a lot of regulation to have well-operating competitive services sector in your economy. So I don't think there is necessarily a contradiction between trade liberalization and uh, uh, regulation. I think the, the concept of trade costs and how to reduce them encompasses both, both issues. Um, on the comment about we don't know what, what is going to happen in the future, I, I mean, I fully agree about that. And, and that's why I think we need to, to define or, or think about systems that establish some sort of communication between them. And, and that's why I was, uh, in terms of suggesting this idea of a potential contribution, not only by WTO, but potential contribution by review thematic review and, and sectoral review mechanisms that can, in fact, feed information to the broader post-2015 development agenda review process, which in any case will be conducted under the aegis of, of the high-level political forum and the ECOSOC. But I think this, this idea of trying to feed issues that come up in the next 15 years in the specialized bodies might be a useful thing to, to think about. Then on the issue of, of, um, of the WTO and, and, and the, the WTO, in fact, dealing with the politically sensitive issues, whereas regionals are not, I think it's interesting to note that many of these politically sensitive issues that uh, Alejandro mentioned, in fact, are the ones that are specifically identified in the SDGs as being able to make a contribution. We have uh, fishery subsidies to, to attain ocean conservation goals. We have the issue of uh, export competition as a barrier to, and I think as a barrier to hunger reduction, etc. And I would tend to agree with that. I mean, probably I was one uh, writing speeches sometimes for, for, for senior officials. But I think the idea is if we want to meaningfully address these issues and for these issues to have a, a, an impact on, say, ocean conservation hunger, they need to be addressed in a multilateral level. I think the, the regional approach for these global issues, I'm not so sure, will be, will be sufficient. It might be one step, but it won't be sufficient. And lastly, I think on the issue of standards, I think the question and what the, the SDGs is pushing us to do a bit, the post-2015 development agenda is pushing us to do, is to think about 
the links between the issues. I mean, on the one hand, we're calling for an increase in aid for trade in the SDG uh, and, and FFD agendas. Well, how can we link that increase in aid for trade to the idea of improving market access? What pragmatic ways could we deal with to, to increase market access for least developed countries? In the standards issue, a lot will have to do with the issue of conformity assessment helping uh, LDCs um, develop an infrastructure that allows them actually to show compliance with the standards. It's not only a matter of meeting the standards, but also having the necessary infrastructure at home, laboratories and, and, and conformity assessment infrastructure to actually show the compliance. And there, I think, one, one, what we're pushed to by the agenda, I think, is to try to think about some of these linkages. How for example, aid for trade could feed into this process and, and help this process of, of building infrastructure, including conformity assessment infrastructure in least developed countries. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marcus. I think I have minus seven minutes to make some responses, so I'll be very quick. Um, just, just a couple of ideas. I think the questions about links between investment and trade and GVCs, this, this complex nexus of different policy areas, I think it's a, an interesting and important debate at the global level, but I think uh, when we think of it from a national perspective, it's particularly important and relevant and challenging. It's something that the bank has been trying to do more at the national level in our work with governments, is bring together these different strands of thought. Uh, on global value chains, what we're trying to do now is uh, help governments develop GVC integration and upgrading strategies where they look not just th at those policy areas, but at what labour market policies they might need, what skills policies they might need, uh, what standards, what you know, laboratory capacity, everything, the whole spectrum of issues. Um, so it, it's, it's a complex <coughs> agenda globally, but at the national level, there is a lot of practical work um, that can be done. Maybe just, just one other point, um, as I think in, in the questions and comments from the panel, there's a lot of anxiety about the future of the WTO, which is a very common thing to hear in Geneva. Uh, obviously, the WTO has gone through a difficult few years, um, but uh, I think from the perspective of the bank, um, some of that anxiety is misplaced. You know, I think that we, we see the multilateral system still as playing an absolutely critical role. I think if we look at the what the potential impacts on developing countries of the global financial crisis would have been, it would have been dramatically uh, more negative if there hadn't been the kind of rules-based system that we have underpinned by the WTO. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's just to give one example. So I think just in, in that function alone, the WTO is doing a good job. We don't necessarily need to, to have an existential fear about other agreements, other structures that are out there looking at different rules that might go beyond what we have in the WTO. Uh, but having said that, those interactions between different levels of negotiations are very important. They'll be important in this sustainable development agenda. Uh, and it's very important for, for um, the largest trading countries in the world, both developing and developed, to think about what they can do to offset any of the negative impacts of things like preference erosion. So there, there is a lot that can be done there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Marcus, I think we can uh, make sure that you, you, you don't believe that we think that WTO is losing uh, its value or interest. We are we're more worried about its impact it has on the on the stuff than rather than its function and its usefulness that we have. But let me make just two or three remarks which I think need, need to be a kind of uh, capped. One is this whole question of re-regulation. For God's sake, no re-regulations. Good regulations, if you have a free, a free trade, means good regulations, not re-regulations. But it does mean a lot of regulation. Otherwise, it's the Wild West. And we have seen it with the financial markets. You know, we need regulations, but it needs to be adapted to the scenario of a free trade to avoid that it becomes the Wild West. So that seems to me very important. The second issue I wanted to say, you know, the, I understand the argument, you know, we, we, we should not jump to the 21st if we haven't solved the 20th. The problem is, you're right, but the problem is the, 20th, uh, the issues of the 21st century are going to be solved without or with us. You know, so we have no choice, uh, actually, because the rules will be made, either with us or without us. So we cannot wait. We have no choice. It's, uh, it's even so logically, you're right. 
I think the most clearly mentioned global value chains is not a question of regulating them in WTO, but I think it's a way of thinking, including you know getting goods, services, and everything, investments into one point of work. It, it's a guide to how, how to address the rules. It's not to, to regulate uh, global value change. I think we all uh, make uh, are, are sure about that. Uh, I wanted to, to make a, a point about the, uh, my friend who has not as much experience as I do <laughs> uh, concerning uh, there are certain issues which I think, yes, they are being addressed partly now in, 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 in these mega deals or whatever, but they really need to, to have a solution they need to have in WTO. But my problem is, when the big countries have gotten what they need among themselves outside, do you think they're going to come to WTO and make concessions to get a deal here? I don't believe that, you know. So if we, if we can't give them anything anymore here, but here they have to come to pay they will not, we will never finish this door around. So that, that is, in my, my opinion, uh, the, the issue of, of the things. Last word, and then I really shut up, uh, the private standards. You know, I like private standards compared to public standards for one reason. A private standard will never be protectionist because they cannot, at the private level, put up protectionist measures. A public standard can always be protectionist. A, a private standard responds to the demand of the, of the consumer. And therefore, you know, they will respond to a demand that is there. And I think we should, uh, we should allow that. And I actually believe that for many countries that might be an advantage. I know I'm not majority on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, well, thank, thank you very much, Nicola. No, I think this is what the agenda mandates yes. that I do. So, so that's why I moved to, next to you, also so that I could um, probably benefit from some wisdom rubbing this, this way, rubbing off this way. So when I said experience, and uh, I meant wisdom and not age. And so I hope you, you, you didn't take it the wrong way. And um, then I don't, I, I don't say anything about Alejandro or his comments. Um, now, the, um, first, uh, thank you for a really very substantive and incredibly rich uh, panel. Uh, I think between this second part and the first part, uh, you, you probably uh, are now better uh, placed, hopefully, to, uh, to see where we are and then try to find out how to contribute so that, again, with the little window of opportunity that we have going forward, uh, something can be done. And so what's the something about? I think that my, my take from here, which um, I must say doesn't really change much um, and the, the way I look at this before, but it's, uh, it just confirms that feeling, is that we need to look at these documents. As I said before, there's a reference document. That's the, the best way in which I can describe it. It is a reference for the international community. Um, it is an effort uh, for the international community to get together, discuss, um, and and then try to put in a piece of paper uh, their shared view and their shared vision of uh, what that future should look like. And that's not an insignificant exercise. It has a great um, uh, volume uh, just as an exercise, uh, trying to make sure people go through a, a very serious thinking about these issues. And that has happened. So in that, in that regard, I think that uh, the process uh, that has led to where we are right now, uh, the various tracks are, are quite impressive. That said, I think that the trade policy community uh, probably stayed behind, and that's reflected in the, in the documents. Uh, I think it was uh, maybe Friedrich or, or Alice, I, I can't remember right now, who spoke about this chilling effect that um, the trade policy and the fact that uh, it is talked about as a technical issue when it's really rather a question of expertise and it's more political than anything else, um, generates uh, a technical e a, a chilling effect on negotiators that are not uh, in the trade policy making driver's seat. That, that's been the case in international cooperation for, for many years. It, it was something that affected in a very negative manner the, the construction of uh, particularly multilateral environmental agreements until someone decided that there's a, a hierarchy of policy objectives 
and that they should just uh, obviously uh, take things uh, as straightforward as they as they had to if they really meant that those objectives were to be achieved. So you use uh, trade-specific uh, obligations in, in agreements, and you do it consistently with the WTO law, which to a great extent allows for that. When it doesn't allow, you come back here and you recraft uh, as if it was easy, but you enter into negotiations and to try to recraft what, we ha what you have in the, in the law book. But what is absolutely critical, and I think this is where, where this um, uh, process of, of New York is very helpful, is to clarify what our objectives and our hierarchy of objectives is. So on that document, we need more of those values and vision. If there was something we can still do about this, we need um, uh, to make sure that it's about guidance. We need to make sure that it is about so providing guidance uh, rather than prescripting, prescripting uh, particularly uh, on policies uh, on issues like trade, um, that it is global as it pretends to be, because it's not, in my view. It, it remains very much in the old uh, uh, approach to the world of the haves and have-nots, uh, without an understanding that uh, searching, or, or ra rather the quest for, for a better balance between, um, well, more equity in the world global, from a global perspective, has to go through trying to uh, understand again that we live in a in a incredibly interconnected world, where the have and the have nots live in economies that are designated as developed or developing, um, uh, sort of sort of um, independently uh, of their own will. Um, same with resources. So we have a distribution of resources that is by by nature the, uh, not necessarily equal. Uh, uh, around countries, there is a heterogeneity uh, in the endowment that we have of those resources, and and then there are issues that are global, and there are issues where uh, uh, policies generate uh, negative externalities with respect to the use of those resources, and that's that's where the document really has to go to. So someone said before that it, it is an, a good document in that it takes us. Uh, from the MDGs into a world where the question of resources and environment is better taken care of, I'm actually quite disappointed in that in that regard. And we and I produced with a number of stakeholders a document a couple of years ago, um, a letter actually that we sent to the co-chairs of the of the SDG working group, open working group at that time, where we indicated that it was very urgent to really again look at the world that we have today uh, and not at uh, sort of the gaps that we have in governance. So it's a very different thing. This is a document that still is very hung up on trying to improve the, the instruments that we have today, rather than looking at the world as it is. Which brings me to the, the next uh, issue, which is that it should make uh, perhaps a better effort to talk about governance. And that's a place where it, um, on, on, uh, on trade, um, it is um, remarkably uh, there's remarkable absence of, of any uh, really good guidance on what uh, the governance, the global governance of the complex trade and investment system that we have today um, should be like or what we should aspire to if it is to support uh, sustainable development outcomes. Then on the specifics of the document, I'd say that it should do no harm, and there are some of the issues there that on trade, we'd rather just clean them out. Uh, we should also probably aim at uh, removing um, a good number of innocuous uh, prescriptive language that is there. I mean, it is prescriptive, but it is innocuous, and it's rather, um, it, it, leaving it there risks, um, uh, again, making, uh, doing harm. And so I would, uh, and, and one point, uh, one, one of those is this conclusion of the negotiation under the Doha Development Agenda. If this is a document that is go going to inform, again, uh, governance in the next 15 years. That's a, that's really a statement that is that is um, of that exact nature that I that I uh, mentioned before. Um, and then make sure that uh, it, issues like what you just mentioned before, aid for trade, um, are dealt with in a 
again, a way that, that uh, we can add value to what is there uh, today, rather than, than just call for, for increases in, uh, in the supply of, of uh, financing for aid for trade. So, so generally speaking, I think that there is a good um, deal of, um, of work to, to do to get the document right. I don't underestimate the incredible challenges of a negotiation of this sort. We ourselves are probably in the, uh, in the best position, if you like, uh, and excuse my immodesty there, to uh, understand the challenges. We have been in that quest of trying to help uh, everybody uh, get a better comprehension of the complexities of the concept of sustainable development and its linkages, its linkages to international trade and, and investment and have been doing it for the past 19 years. And so we know how much work it takes to get there. So with that said, um, my hope is that, that uh, again, this community, that the trade policy community, remains engaged, informed, and that it actually connects with uh, the delegates in New York, uh, the delegates to the Addis uh, Conference on Financing for Development. Uh, there are a number of bus stops in the way uh, up to the, the final decisions and that provide a strategic opportunities to, um, to try to, again, exercise some uh, uh, influence there. And as a wise Brazilian uh, delegate uh, said once to one of my colleagues, uh, in these negotiations, there's really no, nothing that is too much advanced or finished until the gobble really goes down. And so there shouldn't be any discouragement from participating just because you see and, and hear that all this is in, in the advanced stage of, um, of negotiations. So with that, let me thank uh, my colleagues, colleague Alice Tipping and everybody else in the ICTSD team, including the logistics team that have, has um, made all this uh, possible today. As I said before, we will continue to call on you and we will continue to work on these issues to provide analysis as much as we can, report through the BioRes uh, on all this uh, work. Um, we will be uh, organizing dialogues here and in New York in, uh, in the run-up to, again, to the, to the end game. And, uh, uh, and we hope that we can count on you on trying to make this uh, a much better outcome. So thank you all very much and thank you to all the panelists. Thank you.